Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to this latest public meeting um, regarding oversight at Fort Calhoun Station. I'm John Kirkland. I'm the senior resident inspector uh, at Fort Calhoun Station. Uh, the purpose of today's meeting is to uh, update um, the public on the status of oversight at Fort Calhoun Station. <clears throat> this meeting's uh, going to be a little bit different uh, than what we've normally seen before. Uh, from the NRC's perspective, the primary focus of this meeting uh, is to present the results of an inspection uh, that was performed by 15 individuals at the end of February uh, and the beginning of March. <clears throat> Every NRC inspection has what's called an exit meeting uh, where the uh, NRC presents preliminary results of the inspection uh, to the licensee, Omaha Public Power District. Uh, in instances where we have uh, inspections that are of uh, high public interest or uh, high public safety, we will occasionally choose to uh, have that exit meeting in a public format, uh, which is what we're going uh, to do this afternoon. Also a little bit different um, than the way we normally hold these meetings, we're going to have uh, two different question and answer sessions. So the way the meeting will be laid out is um, Greg Warnick, who I'll get to in a minute, uh, will uh, provide the exit, which is, the, as I mentioned, the preliminary inspection results. And we're going to have a question and answer session that only deals with the information that was presented uh, as part of the inspection exit. After that, uh, Omaha Public Power District will give a presentation of their own, and then after that, we will open up for general question and answer, much like what we do uh, at all of our other public meetings. A uh, few things I want to point out um, at the table out front. <clears throat> Some of the documents that we'll discuss today, the confirmatory action letter uh, and the restart and checklist basis document are out there. Uh, also, uh, meeting feedback forms. We're very interested in feedback, both positive and negative. Uh, the feedback forms are postage paid. Uh, so if you could fill those out, uh, either hand them to one of us or mail them in at your convenience, it would be greatly appreciated. Uh, with that, <clears throat> I'm going to let Tony uh, and the other NRC folks introduce themselves. I'm Tony Vagel, and I'm the <coughs> chairman of the oversight panel for Fort Calhoun Station. My name is Mike Kay. I'm a branch chief. I'm responsible for oversight activities at Fort Calhoun Station. I'm Greg Warnick. I'm the senior resident at the San Onofre Station in California, and I was a team leader for this inspection. I'm Jeff Josie. I'm the senior resident inspector at Cooper Nuclear Station and I was a team member for this inspection. Jacob Wingbach, I'm the resident inspector at Fort Calhoun, and I was a team member for this inspection. Thank you. Uh, with that, uh, Lou, if you'd like to introduce your folks. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'm Lou Cortaposi. I'm the site vice president at Fort Calhoun Station and the chief nuclear officer for OPPD. I'm Mike Prosper. I'm the plant manager. I'm Bruce Rash. I'm the senior recovery manager for Fort Calhoun Station. I'm Kerry Enan, the nuclear oversight manager for OPPD. Thanks, Lou. Uh, with that, uh, one other thing real quick on the format. Um, after the first uh, Q&A session, uh, we should be about halfway through our time. So at that point, we're going to take a short break for people to stretch their legs, get their water, use the facilities. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tony to uh, start the meeting. Tony. All right. First, uh, thank you very, very much uh, for coming to this, uh, to this meeting. And this meeting is a continuation of what the NRC said, said that we would do. We said we would be open and transparent in our communications of the, of, in our assessment of Fort Calhoun Station and their readiness for restart. So this is a one of, and we'll have more meetings as, we do, as, our, as our inspections will continue. The other thing I want to emphasize is, as we talked about in previous meetings, is that the NRC is going to be independent and that we're going to be thorough in our evaluation of the operational readiness of Fort Calhoun Station. And what I mean by thorough, 
but what I mean by that is that there's issues at Fort Calhoun, and we're not satisfied that, let's say, if there's a valve or a pump that didn't work, that they just fixed that pump and it's broken, fixed. But we want to make sure that why that that is understood why that pump or valve did not work, that the cause is understood, and then also that they take comprehensive corrective actions to prevent the reoccurrence, that they do a thorough extended condition review as well. What I mean by independent, our activities are completely independent of what the activities that OPPD is doing, in that you know, the goal, their goal, our goal is safety. We're independently evaluating them in that our activities are completely separate from their readiness activities. And within the NRC itself, the, the folks that were on this 15-person team, multiple members were uh, NRC inspectors that had previously been not involved in oversight of Fort Calhoun to provide an, an, another level of independence to ensure that Fort Calhoun can operate safely. Is Fort Calhoun safe today? Yes. And with our inspections and all these activities, we want to make sure that Fort Calhoun continues to be safe. Today, you'll hear, you'll hear a lot of, of detail of this, uh, the, of this inspection that Greg, that, that Greg led. But, and, and out of all that, I think you'll hear that Fort Calhoun Station has made progress. But two, also you'll hear that they're not done. And in addition, you'll hear we're not done in our evaluation of Fort Calhoun readiness. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mike. Thanks, Tony. Uh, good afternoon, and uh, you know, what you're about to hear is the preliminary results of this major team inspection. The, the process that's going to go forward from here is there, you know, what, what you're going to hear is really a high-level discussion. Uh, we've already had a two-and-a-half-hour briefing with the licensee uh, back in March after the team uh, finished up their on-site inspection, and, and so you can imagine if we were to spend two to three hours with you giving you all the details, I think uh, you'd probably end up walking out with, you know, prior to us being done. But, but the bottom line is we're going to give you the high-level results of the inspection. And, and, and after that, uh, the results basically get uh, passed on to the panel that has basically the oversight responsibility for the Fort Calhoun Station. And then the panel will, will look at the recommendations of Greg and his team to determine, uh, you know, do we, do we agree that certain things should be closed? Do we agree that certain things should remain open? And, and what are all the details involved in those decisions? Um, within about 30 days, we plan to issue the inspection report. And, and that report will contain all of the details. There's a lot of uh, different uh, aspects to this inspection that, that, are, that are, aren't going to be talked about today. So I would, I would tell you all, uh, you know, to get the extra level of detail, please uh, pull that report up and, and, and give it a read. After the report is issued, uh, we do plan to update what we call the Manual Chapter 0350 uh, restart checklist basis document. Uh, for those of you that are following along with that, uh, basically that document specifies the, the, the inspection activities that we're performing at the site and uh, uh, it basically provides you with a status of, of what items are closed, what items are open, and it, and it links you to the different reports that, that in, have inspected those, those items. So after we issue the report, we'll revise the basis document and we'll issue that also. With that, I'd like to turn the meeting over to Greg Warnick so that he can provide us with the overall results of the inspection. Thank you, Mike. As mentioned previously, this meeting is to present the results of the restart readiness assessment team inspection 
It was performed by the NRC at the Fort Calhoun station. On-site portions of the inspection were performed January 14 through March 15th of this year. The inspection continued until recently to com until we completed the inspection of the items that were within our scope. The purpose of the inspection was to evaluate the readiness of plant hardware, plant staff, and management programs to support a safe restart and continued safe operation of Fort Calhoun. Specifically, the inspection performed an assessment of the causes of the performance decline at, decline at the station to assess whether planned corrective actions were sufficient to address the root causes and contributing causes and to prevent their recurrence, and to verify that adequate qualitative and quantitative measures for determining the effectiveness of the corrective actions were in place. These assessments will be used by the NRC to independently determine if plant personnel, equipment, and processes are ready to support a safe restart and safe continued operation. In performing the inspection, we used the criteria described in various programmatic NRC inspection procedures and manual chapter 0350 to assess OPPD's performance and progress in implementing its performance improvement initiatives. The team focused on those issues described in the restart checklist and closed in the confirmatory action letter issued to Fort Calhoun on June 11, 2012 and updated on February 26, 2013. And as uh, Mike mentioned, there are copies out on the table as you enter into this area. We reviewed those restart items that were ready for NRC inspection within the time frame necessary for the team to perform an adequate review. In planning the scope of this inspection, the NRC identified 31 areas from the, from the restart checklist. These are performance areas that had been identified that needed corrective action. This included 169 restart items that according to Fort Cahoon Station were ready for the NRC to review. As our team prepared for the inspection and as we commenced our review of these items, we identified that 66 of those items were not, that were supposed to be ready were in fact not fully ready for our review. Consequently, 39% of our original inspection scope was either eliminated or the scope was modified to do a partial review only. In light of this significant scope reduction, the team developed some observations and conclusions that I'd like to briefly mention regarding the station's inspection readiness. The team prepared a, a reviewed a couple of Fort Calhoun station documents that questioned the readiness for this inspection. We did come across a pre-problem identification and resolution self-assessment that was performed from January, excuse me, from December 2012 until the beginning of January of this year, uh, just prior to our on-site inspection, which identified many inadequacies and areas for improvement, and no strengths were noted. We also obtained a nuclear oversight memo that was written uh, to the station in advance of this inspection stating that the site was not ready for some aspects of the inspection. The oversight memo stated in part that the scheduled resolution of some of the identified issues and their subsequent implementation will challenge the inspection date. The impressions that we had from our team during our inspection preparation week were, one, that we noted indicators that many areas involving equipment, people, and processes were still in discovery rather than into corrective action implementation phase. And two, evaluation assessment products look good on paper at the first look, but substance appeared to be lacking once the details were reviewed. During the inspection, our impressions were confirmed. As I'll present here in a moment, the team identified many instances where Fort Calhoun Station failed to fully evaluate and discover key issues, important corrective actions, and important corrective actions had not yet been developed or implemented, and various metrics to measure the effectiveness of the corrective actions still needed to be developed and implemented. We observed that the station was not following the recovery process outlined in the Integrated Performance Improvement Plan. Specifically, the staff was providing inspection information to the NRC as being ready for inspection prior to the 
to it being ready as defined in their program procedures. And finally, the large number and types of issues identified by our 15-member team in only a few weeks using the same techniques, processes, and information that were available to Fort Calhoun Station personnel illustrates that they missed opportunities to identify their own problems and that Fort Calhoun could have been more prepared for this inspection by being more thorough in the discovery, evaluation, and reviews for extent of condition. In fact, out of the 25 performance areas that we did review, the team will only be able to recommend closure of eight of these areas. Also during our review of the areas, the team identified approximately 50 performance deficiencies. A performance deficiency is designed as a, a problem that was reasonably within the ability of the licensee to foresee and correct. So these were issues that the licensee could have come across, could have identified themselves and corrected prior to the identification by the NRC. These preliminary findings, as Mike mentioned, will be mentioned here briefly as they were considered in developing the team's conclusions and recommendations. I'd just like to briefly uh, talk about our process just to help you understand uh, as I present the conclusions, observations, and findings that we had uh, so you can understand the language that I'm talking about. Uh, the problem areas outlined in the restart, basis document, restart checklist basis document are problem areas identified by Fort Calhoun Station due to their performance over the years uh, that needed correction. Uh, as required by the regu regulations, specifically uh, 10 CFR 50 Appendix Bravo Criterion 16, which is for corrective actions, uh, that regulation requires that measures shall be established to assure that conditions averse to quality, such as failures, malfunctions, deficiencies, deviations, defective materials and equipment, and nonconformances are promptly identified and corrected. For significant conditions of versa quality, the measure shall assure that the cause of the condition is determined and corrective action taken to preclude repetition. So the licensee used their corrective action program to, do, to address these performance areas, the areas in the restart checklist. Uh, and majority of the instances, they performed a root cause analysis as required by the regulations and their corrective action program to assess the areas. So our inspection was to assess the evaluations of the assessments performed by the licensee and whether or not they were adequate. In determining the adequacy, we use criteria outlined in one of our inspection procedures, specifically inspection procedure 95001. And the criteria that was, that was used is during our inspection, we uh, did the inspection necessary to determine that the problem was evaluated using a systematic methodology to identify the root and contributing causes, that the root cause evaluation was conducted to a level of detail commensurate with the significance of the problem, that the root cause evaluation included a consideration of prior occurrences of the problems and knowledge of their prior operating experience, that the root cause evaluation addressed the extent of condition and extent of cause of the problem, that the root cause, extent of condition, and extent of cause evaluations appropriately considered the safety culture components, that appropriate corrective actions were specified for each of the root and contributing causes, that a schedule had been established for implementing and completing the actions, and that the quantitative and qualitative measures of success had been developed for determining the effectiveness of the corrective actions to prevent recurrence. So, I'll step through the areas that we inspected uh, by restart checklist item number and share with you the observations and findings that we had and our overall conclusions and recommendations. The first area that we looked at is from section one of the restart checklist basis document. And it had to do with the causes of, of the significant performance deficiencies and assessment of the organizational effectiveness. Item 1A, which was flooding, was related to a yellow finding. Uh, the direct cause associated with that yellow finding, uh, the issues that related to the safety significant issue have been corrected. But our, our focus was looking at the root cause analysis, uh, evaluating it against the criteria that I just described. 
In doing so, we determined that the root cause analysis for the yellow finding was conducted to a level of detail commensurate with the significance of the problem and that it appropriately included consideration of prior operating experience, the extent of cause, and the safety culture components. Through our review, however, the team also determined that the corrective actions have yet to adequately address all of the technical inadequacies of the procedures used to mitigate flooding at the site and the, the extent of condition was adequate. What this means, extent of condition being adequate, is that we're concerned that these procedure inadequacies could be used at the station if not corrected and similar types of problems uh, that caused the yellow finding could also happen. This would be unacceptable uh, by the regulations since, as I shared with you, the regulations require that these types of significant events are precluded from repetition. The team identified six findings related to the failure to address technical inadequacies in the, in the procedures to mitigate flooding. The team judged that this was due in part to the larger site issue of an improper understanding and incorporation of the design and licensing basis. Also, the team noted by a sampling of the low river level and degraded river level procedures that the event that the extent of condition review was inadequate and identified four findings and two unresolved items associated with the issue. An unresolved item, what that means is that the, the team inspected as much information as available and at this point the licensee is reviewing more information to answer additional questions that we have. So an unresolved item is opened for us to come back and do additional inspection to determine if in fact there is a performance deficiency uh, or what the problem uh, ultimately is. Our conclusion is uh, based on the observations that we had that Fort Calhoun Station has not sufficiently resolved several technical issues associated with flooding. Also that an expanded condition, extent of condition review is needed beyond low river level and degraded river level to say the licensee has done an adequate extent of condition review, the team recommends that restart checklist item 1A remain open. The next area reviewed was item 1B, and that's related to the re reactor protection system contact failure, which resulted in a white finding. Again, the equipment issues that resulted in the failure and the significant condition have been corrected. Uh, we assessed the licensee's follow-up actions to these conditions to make sure they've done what's necessary so that these types of problems won't happen again. No specific regulatory findings were identified during our review of this area. However, the team identified several issues related to the root cause analysis associated with this condition. These issues were related to the development of the causal factors and breadth and scope of corrective actions and the quality of the effectiveness reviews. Specifically, the team found that the root cause analysis did not support the identified root cause and contributing causes as the only cause of the event and there were several other failed barriers and causal factors identified by the station that should have been considered root or contributing causes. Now what this means is, is Fort Calhoun Station identified some things that happen. For example, I'll, I'll speak here in a moment to something called the operability determination process. Uh, when the station identifies something in the plant that isn't working right, uh, they are required by procedure to assess that condition and determine whether or not it, it's, it, can be, it can be considered operable in its degraded condition. Operable means that it will continue to perform its required safety function. There were multiple breakdowns in this white finding event, the failure of the M2 contactor, uh, which, which resulted in a white finding. Uh, multiple failures associated with the operability determination pro process, where if that process were working properly, uh, it would have prevented this event. Uh, so that's a, an example of a barrier uh, that should have been uh, considered with a stronger focus as something that needs to be corrected in a, in a more timely fashion 
such that these types of events, a, a, a significant event on the order of a magnitude of a white finding, would not happen again. Based on the issues related to the quality of the root cause that we reviewed, including the development of these causal factors, the breadth and scope of the identified corrective actions, and the quality of the effectiveness reviews, the team recommends that restart checklist item 1B remain open uh, pending additional NRC review of these deficiencies. The next area that we reviewed is item 1C. That was associated with an electrical bus modification and maintenance. Uh, this issue resulted in a red finding. Once again, like the others, the equipment issues and the problems directly related to this red significant finding have been corrected. Uh, so we looked at a couple of root cause analyses associated with the follow-up uh, issues that, that came out of this red finding. The team reviewed two RCAs in particular documented in the Corrective Action Program associated with this issue. During our review of the analyses, the team de determined that both of the analyses were inadequate because of identified issues related to the adequacy and thoroughness of the station's root cause analyses and inadequate measures that had been put in place to ensure the issue would not recur. Specifically, the licensee's root cause analysis associated with breaker testing was inadequate because the licensee failed to identify the station's need to implement corrective actions associated with the improper setup and testing of the new style breakers that caused the fire. Instead, the licensee determined that the vendor was at fault and all corrective actions would be the vendor's responsibility. And consequently, the station no, had no further corrective actions identified that were required for this deficiency. Uh, this was an issue to us as we uh, came across this because ultimately it's the license holder's responsibility to make sure their problems are corrected. Uh, they shouldn't be deferring the correction of problems that affected their site and plant safety uh, to a vendor or an outside contractor. Also, the effectiveness reviews implemented by the licensee were not adequate to demonstrate that appropriate corrective actions had been put in place to prevent recurrence of the issue being corrected. The team also identified two findings associated with our review of this area. Based on the team's determination that Fort Calhoun had failed to identify and correct all of the root causes associated with the red finding, and the identified identification of previously identified and uncorrected vulnerabilities associated with the 480 volt electrical distribution system, the team will be recommending that restart checklist 1C remain open. The next area we looked at was item 1E, and that's associated with a third party safety culture assessment. This assessment is required by a station or by a licensee in this uh, area of the NRC action matrix, and it's specifically, specifically required by inspection procedure 95003. There are two parts to this. Uh, the first part was that the licensee uh, needed to do a third party uh, assessment of their safety culture. Uh, the team concluded that that third party assessment was comprehensive, that the methods used by the contractor that, that performed the third party assessment, Conger and Elsie, were acceptable, and that the licensee's actions to communicate the results to the various levels of staff and management were adequate. Based on observations gathered from the NRC's graded safety culture assessment, that's the part that the NRC did, the licensee has taken actions to address the issues identified in this assessment. However, at this time, it's still premature to assess the effectiveness of all of the actions taken with regards to the overall safety culture. Uh, the bottom line is, however, we did determine they did a good assessment they're doing a good job at, at communicating that to people at the plant. And in the small focus groups that uh, the NRC teams performed, uh, we had a lot of feedback from plant employees that talked about the improvements at the station related to safety culture. Uh, but this will be something that the station will continue to watch and the NRC will continue to watch to make sure they 
continue on an improving trend. The next part of this inspection looked at some of the fundamental performance deficiencies that Fort Calhoun Station identified associated with this area, specifically the fundamental performance deficiencies of nuclear safety culture and safety conscious work environment. We evaluated the root cause analyses associated with those FPDs and determined that the root and contributing causes of the risk significant issues were well understood, that the extent of condition and the extent of cause of those issues were identified, and that the corrective actions to address the performance issues were or will be sufficient to address the root and contributing causes to preclude repetition. As I shared with you earlier by our regulations, uh, that's the adequate uh, level of performance that we look for. And we found that in this area, and consequently, we will be recommending that area 1 ECHO 1E be closed. Next area we looked at is item 1F, and that was related to an integrated organizational, organizational effectiveness assessment. Uh, specifically, we looked at another fundamental performance <clears throat> deficiency related to this area that uh, the licensee had performed a root cause to assess the situation. Uh, similar to the last area, uh, we found this uh, uh, root cause analysis to be very thorough. Uh, the licensee did a good job to identify the root and contributing causes, uh, to identify the extent of condition and extent of causes, and identify and implement corrective actions to address this significant performance area. <clears throat> uh, we were satisfied that the actions would or will be adequate to preclude repetition of this significant issue. And therefore, the team will recommend that this area also be closed. The next area we looked at is 1G. And that's related to a safety system or to multiple safety system functional failures that resulted in a white performance indicator. A performance indicator is one of the measurements that the NRC uses to measure performance of a license holder. Uh, specifically, there were license event reports documenting each of the safety system functional failures. Uh, there were nine of them uh, that were entered into the licensee's corrective action program. Uh, at the time of when we prepared for this inspection, we thought we'd be able to, to review uh, a good portion of those licensee event reports. However, as we started the inspection and uh, uh, got well into the inspection, uh, as I kind of mentioned previously, it became evident that the event reports and the root cause analyses were not ready for our review. Uh, they had not progressed to a, to a point where we could do an adequate review. Uh, in fact, only one of the license event reports were ready for our review, and we did review that, and as I'll mention uh, a little later, uh, we found that license event report to be adequate, the root cause analysis associated with it, and we will be closing that license event report. Uh, we will need to do additional inspection in this, in this area to review the other eight license event reports, and we'll be doing that at a later point and consequently, this inspection area will remain open. Uh, the next section of the restart checklist is section two, and that's related to flood restoration and adequacy of structures, systems, and components. The first area we looked at was item 2B, and that was related to a, safety, a, a system readiness for restart. Uh, well, it's to determine if systems were ready for restart following the extended plant shutdown. Specifically, the licensee took it upon themselves uh, to do a number of system health reviews. Uh, we selected a few of the system health reviews uh, to look at ourselves, to do a detailed review ourselves, independent. Uh, we went out in the plant, walked down systems to try and make sure that they identified everything that they should have identified to make sure that the systems can, re can support safe plan operations following this <clears throat> extended shutdown. At the time of the inspection, the licensee was not ready for the team's review of this restart checklist item. Specifically, the systems within the scope of the inspection had large list of open items that were identified. 
by the licensee. Uh, example of these types of open items were condition reports, modifications, and open work orders that still needed to be addressed to fully make the system ready for heat up and or power operations. The licensee themselves concluded that the systems reviewed were not ready for restart, and we agreed based on what we looked at. In many cases, the open items identified were associated with issues related to equipment service life. This is another area that we actually had to scope out of our inspection because they also were not ready for us to look at this uh, equi equipment service life issue. Because the systems were determined to be not ready for restart, the team performed a limited scope review of several of the system health readiness review books or reports and found the list of necessary corrective actions needed prior to restart to be very thorough and, perf and performed in accordance with station procedures. The team found, however, that the system health readiness reviews did not document how or when corrective actions would be implemented to address the large list of open items and did not see a mechanism in place to verify all of the items in the system health readiness review reports were completed prior to declaring the system ready for restart. The team also identified two findings associated with our limited review of this area. We concluded that the scope associated with the licensee's system health readiness review for the auxiliary feed water system, for the emergency core cooling system, and for the emergency diesel generator systems was adequate and in accordance with procedures. However, the team noted that the large number of outstanding corrective actions and work orders remaining, remain open for each of the systems reviewed. So pending completion of those open items identified by the licensee and follow-up assessment by another team within the NRC, this restart checklist item will remain open. The next area looked at uh, under uh, systems structure systems and components, making sure they're ready to support safe plan operations, uh, was a detailed review of a number of systems, specifically the AC and DC electrical distribution, the high pressure safety injection, the emergency diesel generator system, and the reactor protection system. The team assessed the adequacy of each of the licensees' detailed reviews and selected samples for an independent verification the team observed that the licensee's detailed system reviews for the five-year period was performed in accordance with station procedures. However, the team noted that a large number of design issues were recently discovered that fell outside the licensee's five-year scope. The team found this to be an indication that the licensee's scope was too narrowly focused. Additionally, for several of the design issues identified by the licensee, the evaluation and corrective actions appear to be inadequate because they lack sufficient de technical detail of the, tech of the licensing basis justification for the proposed action. The team also identified two findings associated with the AC and DC electrical distribution system that were not identified during the licensee's detailed reviews. Because of the ab above identified issues involving adequacy of scope and adequacy of corrective actions, the team recommends that restart checklist item 2B2 remain open. Section three of the restart checklist basis document is the next area that we looked at and that's associated with the adequacy of significant programs and processes. The first program that we looked at was the corrective action program. The team determined that the root cause analysis was analyses, there were a couple of them performed, were conducted to a level of detail commensurate with the significance of the problem. The team found that the licensee's corrective actions, although necessary, were very general in nature. More specifically, the team noted that the licensee's corrective action plan did not include actions to specifically target some of the contributing causes. And as a result, the licensee is relying on the corrective actions which focus primarily on changing the mental models 
beliefs, values, and behaviors to resolve the corrective action program effectiveness. We saw this to be uh, an inefficiency in how they're going about to fix their problems. Uh, with the criteria I shared with you earlier, we want to see that there are actions to address not only the root causes, but the contributing causes also, such that the significant, safety significant performance area will be corrected to preclude repetition. The team, uh, this has led to continued deficiencies in the corrective action program behaviors, uh, the approach that they took in just trying to focus on the behavior model. As noted in examples uh, below for the three major corrective action program areas. Uh, the first area that we looked at is identification of problems. The team identified a finding associated with 11 examples where the licensee did not enter conditions adverse to quality into the corrective action program when they were identified. The team identified another finding associated with seven examples where the licensee did not identify that a condition adverse to quality existed associated with structures, systems, or components. The other, another area, the second area, is prioritization and evaluation of issues. During this inspection and also during previous inspections in 2012, the inspectors identified five examples where the licensee did not appropriately classify condition reports in accordance with the safety significance of the issue. The team identified eight examples where the licensee had not completed an adequate extent of condition evaluation for significant conditions averse to quality. During the inspection, the team identified 14 examples where the evaluation of operability or reportability was not, completely, was not completed appropriately. The team identified six instances where the root and apparent cause analyses prepared by the licensee to address a significant condition adverse to quality was inadequate. The third area under corrective action program was effectiveness of corrective actions. During the course of the inspection, the team identified five examples where the licensee failed to take appropriate or timely corrective actions commensurate with the issue's safety significance. The team identified six examples where the licensee did not perform adequate effective effectiveness reviews of corrective actions to prevent recurrence in accordance with station procedures. Additionally, internal licensee corrective action program metrics still show room for much improvement. In fact, the team was recently informed that a new root cause analysis has been initiated to address continued deficiencies in this area. The team does believe that CAP is functional. Uh, still has work to go as illustrated by the many issues that we saw uh, and as evidenced by the licensee's own metrics and the fact that they're do redoing another root cause analysis. <clears throat> The team did determine that more time is needed after the inception of the new corrective action program procedures and incorporation of new Exelon management, which happened in August of last year, to be effect, to affect change in, in corrective action program behaviors. Based on the number of issues identified and the licensee's identification that a new root cause analysis is needed to correct the continuing deficiencies in the area, the team will recommend that restart checklist item 3A remain open. The next area we looked at was item 3B1 related to the safety related parts program. Uh, specifically, we looked at the licensee's assessment, a root cause analysis associated with safety related parts program at Fort Calhoun. The team determined that the root cause, that the root and contributing causes reasonably explain why the safety related parts program at Fort Calhoun failed to maintain design control such that non-safety grade parts have been installed in safety grade applications. However, the team identified that the root cause analysis appeared to be incomplete because it did not address Fort Calhoun station's ability to properly classify structures, systems, and components as safety related. This is a deficiency that the NRC has known about, uh, Fort Calhoun has known about it, uh, but this seemed to be an oversight in their root cause analysis. Uh, specifically, we concluded it was an oversight because in the restart 
checklist basis document, item 3B1, safety related parts, specifically identified that the NRC will assess the licensee's equipment design quality classifications review for ins inconsistent quality classifications. And again, this was not addressed in their root cause analysis. The team also identified examples related to their ability to classify uh, structure system components as safety related. We determined that the ability to classify components as safety related will be an unresolved item that will require further NRC inspection to determine if the issue represents a performance deficiency or constitutes viola a violation of regulatory requirements. Based on the observation that the root cause analysis did not address the ability of the station to properly classify structures, systems, and components as safety related, the team recommends that restart checklist item 3B1 remain open. Item 3B2 related to high energy line break program and equipment qualifications. Uh, we looked at the uh, analyses performed for this area. As we started looking into it, we, we observed that uh, OPPD in fact recognized that the high energy line break program and the equipment qualification program was fundamentally degraded at the station. However, uh, we also noted through conversations that we had that the licensee did not enter this into the corrective action program. Instead, the programs were being reconstituted by a station initiative. The team had to prompt the licensee to enter this issue into the corrective action program for resolution. And RCA is now in progress, or, or was in progress at the, t at the end of our inspection as we completed things. So we were not able to review that, this area completely uh, uh, to our satisfaction. Uh, we did identify five, five findings associated with, their, with our review of this area. Based on the team's determination that the licensee has yet to determine the causes of the problems and implement appropriate corrective actions, and the licensee has not completed implementation of the actions required to reconstitute this affected program, restart checklist item 3B2 will remain open. Item 3C uh, had us look at design changes and modifications. The team performed an independent review of one modification associated with uh, a modification to piping and supports for, for FW10 main steam supply and high energy line break concerns. This was a limited scope review looking only at the modification package since the in-plant modification was not completed at the time of this inspection. During the review, the team assessed the effectiveness of the licensee's process for preparing the modification. The associated evaluations required by the regulation, which is 10 CFR 50.59, and how required updates to the updated safety analysis report were identified for, for incorporation. The team concluded that the licensee had appropriately evaluated this modification. Pending installation and acceptance of this modification and a follow-up assessment by the NRC, uh, this checklist item will remain open. Item 3C2 uh, specifically looked at uh, 10 CFR 50, 59 screenings and safety evaluations. Uh, this is a regulation used by licensees uh, to make changes to the facility. Uh, we specifically looked at the assessment or root cause analysis and actions taken to uh, make sure the licensee was, was meeting the, the minimum standards required by the regulation. The team determined that Fort Calhoun Station conducted the root cause evaluation to a level of detail commensurate with the significance of the problem. The root cause adequately considered prior operating experience and safety culture components. The team determined, however, that the root cause evaluation did not fully address the extent of condition and the extent of cause of the problem. Uh, again, extent of condition, extent of cause, uh, 
that looks at where, where else can the same, same types of behaviors, uh, what other programs are there uh, at Fort Calhoun where the, the fundamental issues that led to their performance in the area of 10 CFR 5059, uh, where else could these problems exist? And is the licensee correcting those problems such that this safety significant issue will not recur? The licensee, in, as we looked at it, did not consider an appropriate extent of condition as exempli exemplified by their limited scope review of approximately five years for all of the systems. And this gets back to what I talked about earlier, where we determined that uh, uh, the scope in some of these cases was too narrowly focused, uh, primarily because we identified a lot of issues, the licensee has identified a lot of issues only recently uh, that predate this five-year scope. The team noted several uh, that several of these 5059 errors, uh, like I said, pre predated it. And specific examples include tornado missiles, uh, piping code issues, intake cell level controls for flooding. Uh, this is related to the yellow finding, alternate seismic criteria, and equipment reclassification. The team identified a fi one finding and two resolved items associated with the inspection of this area. The team noted that the site-wide knowledge of the 5059 process was previously weak. The licensee had scheduled training to upgrade the station's knowledge, but this training had not been started at the time of our inspection. In the interim time until training was completed, uh, a group uh, at the station was formed. They call this group the Engineering Assurance Group. Uh, but we noted that, that, uh, that the performance of that group was not strong. Uh, specifically, the engineering group was, review was reviewing all 5059 evaluations, and the team noted that a recent 5059 evaluation for a tra trash rack modification had passed their review with an error in the final conclusion and that conclusion was that they did not need to seek prior NRC approval prior to making a change to the facility. The team coupled this instance of weak uh, engineering assurance group performance with other noted deficiencies in operability determinations, which I'll talk about here shortly, by the engineering assurance group discovered by the team. An overall conclusion of the inspection was that the licensee had a weak understanding of the design and licensing basis at this stage, and that making changes to the, facil to the facility as described in the updated final safety analysis report was challenged until actions to correct uh, these issues were effective. Based on the above observations and findings related to the extent of condition, review being inadequate, the training still needing to be done, the performance of the interim engineering assurance group being weak, and that making changes with a weak knowledge of the licensing and design basis would likely produce erroneous results. The team recommends that restart checklist item 3C2 remain open. Item 3D1, that's for vendor manuals and vendor informational control programs. Uh, we looked at the licensee's assessment or root cause analysis associated with their review of this area. The team concluded that the apparent and contributing causes of the risk significant issues were understood. The extent of condition and extent of cause of the risk significant issues were identified and the licensee's corrective actions for risk significant performance areas were or will be sufficient to address the apparent and contributing causes and to preclude repetition. Therefore, the team is recommending, uh, due to their good performance in this area, that the restart checklist item be closed. Next item is 3E, and that's related to operability process. I had previ previously mentioned this, this area. Uh, as it related to the engineering assurance group. Uh, we looked at uh, licensee characterized this as another fundamental performance uh, deficiency in an area that we looked at. 
the team identified several issues re related to the quality of the root cause analysis, including development of causal factors, identification of extent of condition, timing and prioritization of corrective actions, and the quality of the effectiveness reviews. Specifically, we found that the root cause analysis did not support the identified root cause and contributing causes as the only causes of the event. And there were several other failed barriers and causal factors identified that should have also been considered as root and contributing causes. Because of this, the team determined that corrective actions may not be appropriately prioritized and sufficiently rigorous to ensure that the operability determinations and evaluation of degraded and nonconforming conditions made in the near future will be accurate and timely. We also found that the licensee's extent of condition was inadequate because several inadequate operability determinations and several previously unrecognized degraded and nonconforming conditions were identified by our team during the inspection. Finally, the team determined that the root cause analysis effectiveness measures did not meet the criteria established in station procedures. These procedures require that an effective effectiveness review includes specific success criteria, uh, which the ones we looked, looked at did not. Uh, the team identified five, five findings, and these findings included multiple examples of failures to perform adequate operability determinations. Based on these issues, as discussed, of the root cause uh, quality, including the development, develop, development of causal factors, adequate identification of extent of conditions, the timing and priority prioritization of corrective actions, and the quality of the effectiveness reviews, uh, we will recommend that restart checklist item 3E remain open. Item 3F is quality assurance. Uh, this was also identified as a fundamental performance deficiency by the licensee, and we reviewed the root cause analysis associated with this area. The team determined that the root cause analysis was conducted to a level of detail commensurate with the significance of the problem. We found that it did a good job in identifying the extent of condition, the extent of cause, and the safety culture components. Finally, we determined that the corrective actions adequately addressed the root and contributing causes. Uh, we actually only had one uh, observation of note, and I actually mentioned it uh, in my opening remarks. And this was related to the memo. Uh, nuclear Oversight, uh, we concluded, did a good job at evaluating the readiness of Fort Calhoun Station for this inspection. In fact, uh, uh, they expressed concern uh, that the actions necessary to, to get the, the items they were working on to the point of adequacy uh, would be challenged. Uh, consequently, uh, based on what we saw, the good performance, good evaluation by the licensee in this area, uh, we, re uh, we will recommend that this restart checklist item be closed. The next section of the, of the CAL and the restart checklist that was looked at was a review of the integrated performance improvement plan. Uh, this is a plan used by Fort Calhoun Station, uh, which is uh, provided to the NRC, which outlines uh, the path that Fort Calhoun and OPPD will take uh, to get themselves to a level of performance that's adequate to safely restart and continue to operate safely, uh, to operate the unit safely. Uh, we did complete a review of revision four to the IPIP, the Integrated Performance Improvement Plan, and we observ observed that previous concerns that the NRC had associated with Rev 3 uh, were in fact addressed in Rev 4. Uh, we did note in the Integrated Performance Improvement Plan uh, that the plan and supporting activities and resulting schedules are living documents. In fact, uh, uh, OPPD has committed uh, additional issues, extent of conditions, and other items of impact as they are identified that the plan will be revised. As we noted these comments, uh, I actually question the licensee whether or not uh, a revision is in pro was in progress. Uh, that question had to do with the confirmatory action letter update that was issued in February. And in fact, the licensee informed me that revision five of the IPIP was in progress. 
Um, so we reviewed Rev 4 in accordance with the restart checklist that item that we have this area. Uh, it's to review all revisions of the IPIP and therefore this item will remain open uh, pending our review of the next revision of the of Fort Calhoun Station's Integrated Performance Improvement Plan. The next area was uh, Section 5. That's the assessment of NRC inspection procedures as they relate to the inspection procedure 95003 key attributes. The first area is item 5A, and that's related to design. We independently assess the extent of the risk significant issues. Uh, these issues cover the as-built design features of the auxiliary feed, excuse me, the auxiliary feed water system. Uh, we also looked at the fundamental performance deficiency that was done through a root cause analysis for this area. The team observed that the licensee's root cause analysis placed most of the fault for the, for the issues in this area on the old management team and relied on the management change as a corrective actions to prevent recurrence of issues associated with design control. This was done even though the licensee identified two fundamental organizational issues that were not connected to management. Specifically, the training program for engineers was below standard, and the level of knowledge of engineer staff regarding design and licensing basis was below standard. It appeared that Fort Calhoun Station reviewed the plant's specific licensing basis, uh, that they viewed it as being optional, as if they could find as if they could find another NRC document that appeared to be less restrictive. Uh, specifically, Fort Calhoun has been selectively committing to portions of certain regulatory guides and branch technical positions, or citing sections of the standard review plan, or SECI, SECI papers, which appeared to have been inappropriately used to change their licensing basis. We reviewed the licensee's root cause analysis and determined it to be inadequate for these reasons. Specifically, the team determined that the licensee analysis failed to determine the real root cause. The failure, or, or all of the root causes, certainly old management could have one, been one of the causes, but we identified that there were others. This failure resulted in the licensee either failing to identify appropriate corrective actions and or in, inadequately prioritizing corrective action implementation. We identified 14 findings related to the inadequate implementation of engineering design and configuration control. The team determined that Fort Calhoun Station has not fully identified the cause of this issue and corrected it, and that Fort Calhoun Station is not able to fully articulate its design and licensing basis because of the modifications that have been allowed to date. Subsequently, Fort Calhoun has also determined that this area is not ready and is in fact performing another root cause analysis. Therefore, this restart checklist item will remain open. Item 5D is related to human performance. Uh, we reviewed the fundamental performance deficiency associated with this area. The team concluded that the root and contributing causes of this risk significant issue were understood. They did a good job at looking for the extent of condition, extent of cause, and identify the action necess actions necessary uh, to put in place such that the problem is resolved. Effectiveness measures will measure performance such that uh, they will preclude repetition of another significant human performance event. We did not identify any specific regulatory findings in this area, but did have one observation related to the effectiveness measures for this root cause. The team observed that the metrics used to measure human performance as part of the interim effectiveness review do not provide meaningful data due to existing plant conditions. Uh, the metrics used are, are industry-wide metrics in many cases, and, and really rely on app power situations to collect the data necessary to populate the, net, the metric. Additionally, there were changes made to the condition report coding process, uh, which could impact the populating of the metrics. 
uh, we will recommend that this restart checklist item be closed. Uh, now, I do want to point out here, I'm talking about a lot of human performance issues that, that we identified happening at the plant associated with inadequate reviews of, of uh, operability determinations, uh, of reportability reviews, of design reviews. Uh, so our review here doesn't mean that they won't have any human performance problems. Uh, what it does mean is that uh, the problems are well understood. Uh, they're putting into place good corrective actions to turn the performance. We're satisfied that if these corrective actions remain in place, that, they, that, that if they have good effectiveness measures in place to monitor the corrective actions, that they will continue on the path of improvement such that a safety significant, uh, the significant to the significant level that we're talking about of a colored finding uh, will not recur. Next area we looked at was item 5D that had to do with equipment performance. Uh, specifically here, we just looked at one license event report. Uh, that was event report 2012-005-01. Uh, uh, this was, in fact, the one that I mentioned earlier related to the safety system functional failure or the white performance indicator that we looked at. This was the one out of the nine that was ready for our review. And we will be closing this license event report. Item 5K is resource management. Uh, the team looked at the fundamental performance review associate deficiency associated with this area. Uh, we identified or, or concluded that the root and contributing causes of the risk significant issues were understood. A uh, licensee did a good job at extent of condition and extent of cause. Uh, that the corrective actions for the performance issues when implemented uh, should or, or at least are having an effect or will continue to have an effect on improving the performance in this area. Uh, therefore, this inspection area will be closed. Item 5, Lima L, process for meeting regulatory requirements. Uh, this was also a fundamental performance deficiency identified by the licensee, and we reviewed the root cause analysis with, associated with this area. <clears throat> We determined several issues in this area related to the quality of the root cause analysis, including the development of causal factors, identification of, of extent of condition, and the timing and prioritization of corrective actions, and the quality of the effectiveness reviews. Specifically, we found, we found that the root cause analysis did not support the identified root cause and contributing causes as the only causes of the event. And there were several other failed barriers and causal factors identified that should have been considered as root or contributing causes. Because of this, the team determined uh, that the corrective actions may be inappropriately prioritized or not of significant rigor. Significant rigor. Uh, during the inspection, the team identified several recent evaluations this, this is what helped us to, to reach these conclusions. Uh, we identified several recent evaluations, as previously discussed, uh, related to operability determinations, uh, reportability reviews, uh, screenings of, and evaluations of, of 10 CFR 5059 plant changes, and the maintenance rule that were inadequate. Uh, these inadequate evaluations were previously referenced, as I, as I discussed. And again, this is indication to us that uh, the corrective actions have not been effective. Finally, the team determined that the root cause analysis effectiveness measure did not meet the station's program uh, associated with needing to have specific success criteria. Uh, we identified two findings that included multiple examples of failing to make required reports to the NRC. Uh, reports are required by the regulations, specifically 10 CFR 5072 and 73, and we identified multiple examples where this was not done. Uh, based on issues related to the quality of that root cause, uh, the team recommends that this area remain open for further inspection. Item 5M, performance improvement. Uh, we reviewed the fundamental performance deficiency or root cause analysis associated with this area. 
Uh, the team noted in December of 2012 that an on-site reviewer from Exelon performed an assessment of the licensee's root cause analysis for this area and determined that it was in fact unacceptable and did not meet industry standards. Consequently, the decision was made by the management to revise the causes and corrective action plan based on the comments of this Exelon reviewer. The root cause data analysis was not re-performed. Instead, the revision only included changes to the causes and corrective action plan. The team reviewed uh, revision one of the root cause and determined that it was also inadequate since some of the corrective actions were inappropriately canceled through the revision, leaving no other corrective action to address the identified extent of condition related to training inadequacies. The revision to the root cause analysis also changed or delete, uh, only changed or deleted the causes and corrective action plan, and consequently the reference causes and corrective actions in the safety culture review were no longer applicable and the effectiveness reviews specified in the root cause were incorrect. Thus, the identified effectiveness reviews would not have appropriately measured the effectiveness of the corrective actions to prevent recurrence. Based on the inspection team's findings, revision two of the root cause analysis was completed in April of this year. Those results were communicated to me. I reviewed revision two of the, of the reactor excuse me, of the root cause analysis. And I did conclude that the deficiencies were resolved such that with revision two of the root cause analysis, uh, they did identify the root and contributing causes and uh, did an adequate job to address this significant performance area. Uh, thus, we will be closing this inspection area. Finally, the last section that we reviewed was associated with licensing issue resolution. That's section six of the restart checklist. Uh, specifically, item 6B, uh, we performed a review of licensing commitments necessary for restart. Uh, the team did com conduct that commitment audit, focusing on the implementation of regulatory commitments. Based on the results of the audit, the NRC staff concluded that the licensee has implemented an effective program to manage current and future regulatory commitments and regulatory commitment changes in accordance with the guidance contained in NEI 9904. And therefore, the team will recommend that this restart checklist item be closed. That concludes the results of our inspection. Uh, it was a big inspection, as you can see here, at the high-level summary I gave you. I encourage you for the details associated with uh, what we presented here. As Mike indicated, they will be in, in very great detail in the inspection report, uh, which should be out in the next 30 days. At this point, I'll turn the time back over to Mike. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. I'll, I'll keep my points pretty quick because I know we're running a little bit late and we definitely want to hear from the, from the public. Uh, Tony mentioned that we're independent and thorough. I think, I think from listening to Greg, you can understand that, that we are both of those. Uh, but I, I don't want people to come across thinking that this is the end. Um, this team did identify a lot of things. And, and this team has given the licensee what, what, what I see as a direct path in what needs to be done to, to get to the point to where we can seriously consider is the safe ready for restart. Um, but there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, there's a lot of things that need to be done, but we are starting to get a clearer picture of what those things are. Um, you know, we, I guess to try to synthesize what Greg talked about into plain English, the corrective action process is obviously one of the most important aspects of, uh, of uh, running a nuclear plant that, that the NRC must have confidence in. and and. By and large, we are seeing that the licensee's use of the cap is better. They're getting a lot of issues into the process. And, and what, what, what we're telling people today is that we need to see improvement in the ability to consistently evaluate those problems better, to consistently look at the full extent 
of the condition better. Um, you know, Greg, Greg mentioned that, 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 that the specific greater than green issues, the fire, the flooding, um, the reactor protection system, those specific problems are fixed. Uh, we don't have concerns with those specific problems. But, but what we want to ensure is that all the causes that ended up creating those problems, that those causes are adequately looked at and, 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 and that, that they're addressed so that other things uh, can't happen like that resulted in, in those colored findings. So from, from a high-level perspective, what, what we're saying is we, we definitely have, have uh, uh, concerns with respect to the licensees design basis. There are areas where the design needs to be better understood. It needs to be better documented, uh, better analysis. There are some areas that, that have to be focused on. People have to have a better understanding of how to use the design basis information, whether they're using that information to evaluate something in the corrective action process, whether they're using that to evaluate operability of a degraded or non-conforming condition, um, or they're doing it to make a change to the plant. You know, people have to understand the design and they have to understand the requirements a little better. So from, from my perspective, that's what I got from this team's inspection. And, and I, you know, I think we'll be listening to the licensee here shortly to see what their thoughts are from this inspection. But, uh, but I, I just like to conclude by saying, you know, I, I think we have a better picture of what needs to be done and, uh, and it is a lot and there's going to be a lot more inspections, but, but I think we are getting closer to, to having a better picture of what is, of what is ultimately needed. Tony. Thanks, Mike. No, Greg, thank you very, very much. Um, for leading the team and also for providing that was the the executive summary but there was a lot more work that went behind every one of the issues and like mike said that was a, this inspector 15 inspectors going in taking a hard look and, and if you kind of summarize it okay fort calhoun also did a lot of work in their areas they said nrc we're ready for you guys to the NRC to come and take the independent look. End result, well, some some weren't ready as they thought they were. And then in other areas, we found that, yes, they did do a thorough evaluation and they have corrective action placed to address that. And from our independent review, we said, good. You know, and some of them are very important. The, the nuclear oversight, for example, safety culture that's that's good but then now uh, that's a, that's the good stuff but then you look at other areas there, there extensive work needs to be done and 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 has mike has said you know one of the key areas is the corrective action program consistent implementation that is key understanding the design basis and utilizing the design basis that is also very key and they need to take steps to to make sure consistency in in those areas as well as in other areas that needs to be uh, addressed and then and until you heard sometimes it would sound like mix they did a very good job in some areas like ox feed water system reviews emergency diesels very important systems but then there was other ones that you know they're either they're still in progress or more work needs to be done so the bottom line like this was probably the first in a series of inspections that we'll be conducting to ensure independently the operational readiness of Fort Calhoun station and I think since we left the site Fort Calhoun has done a lot of work and really started to address this issue but we'll be back and we will again independently evaluate each of these areas to make sure from a safety perspective that they address the, these areas adequately so with that I'll turn it over to John uh, we could I think we're running about an hour and a half we could probably take a break now I would suggest and then we get right into the 
question and answer period for the, the public to ask us questions regarding this inspection. I think that would work. Okay, with that, uh, let's plan on starting back. I have uh, 20 after, so we'll go at half past. Thank you. Okay, now we're going to go through our first uh, question and answer session. And what we would like this Q&A session to be uh, are questions directed to the NRC regarding the information of the inspection and the inspection exit uh, that we just heard from Greg. As I mentioned before, after that, um, Fort Calhoun will give a short presentation and then we will open it up for the general, general Q&A like we, we normally do. Hey, most of the people here have, have been here before and, and how we like to work uh, the question and answer sessions. Uh, we do have uh, note cards on the table uh, when you walked in if you don't feel comfortable uh, in front of a camera and would like to write your questions down. Um, you can get them to me and uh, I can read them that way if you'd like. Um, other than that, uh, when you do um, pose your question, if you'd uh, please give your name and any affiliation uh, that you wish to be uh, noted to, I would appreciate that. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna open it up for anybody on uh, questions related to the inspection report exit. Oh boy. My name is Mary Ann Krasman. I live on 1902 O Street. Thank you, gentlemen, for changing the meeting location. Fixing immediate problems without looking thoroughly at the full extent of what caused the problems seems to be a reoccurring performance deficiency at Fort Calhoun. OPPD asserts it has fixed the electrical bus problems that led to the catastrophic switchgear fire, the tripping of breakers, and the loss of cooling for the fuel rods in 2011. Problems that led the NRC to issue three red findings, denoting high safety significance for these violations. In contrast, the NRC has pointed out that OPPD's decision to restore the original bus configuration still leaves it vulnerable to the same or similar thing happening again. I'd like to hear from the NRC more details about its concerns regarding OPPD's electrical bus modification and maintenance at Fort Calhoun and the subsequent actions OPPD has taken to address its deficiencies. Thank you. Uh, and that's, that's a very good, good question. And I think we, we had a similar question the last meeting, but uh, there's been a lot of inspection regarding the, the red breaker event. The, you know, as we discussed today, the, the, the causes for why the fire occurred have been addressed. You know, there was maintenance activities that could have been better. There were some misalignments that uh, 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 caused high resistance connections that were fixed. Uh, there was a jumper that was installed wrong that has been identified and fixed. So by and large, the, the factors that created the fire and the factors that created the event being more significant than, than, than what it should have been have been corrected. There, there are some additional concerns that we have put in our reports that deal with was the original design of the system adequate, uh, specifically should a fire in one train affect another train? And currently the NRC is still reviewing the adequacy of the licensee's design and still determining whether or not we think any additional actions are needed to, to address those, those specific types of concerns. I want you to know that I expect all electrical bus design vulnerabilities to be removed and I expect full compliance with all current industry standards. Thank well, thank you, and I, and I would tell you that we expect that also. Lynn Moorer, 
Uh, before I get into my specific question here, I want to note that it appears that you may have added on to the restart checklist. Um, Mr. Warnick was referring to items beyond 5I, like you're talking about 5L and 5M, and the restart checklist dated February 26th only goes through 5I. So we may not have the most current restart checklist you've got. Uh, that's a good point. You picked up on that. Uh, I was careful to not call those. <laughs> I was careful to not call those uh, other items restart checklist items. I called them inspection areas. Uh, we decided to include them in this inspection as inspection areas, resource management, uh, uh, performance improvements, some of those uh, higher fives, uh, because they are still fundamental to the performance deficiencies at Fort Calhoun. Uh, not fundamental to safe operation, which is what the restart checklist is looking at, but still areas that we want to look at to see that, that uh, OPPD is taking actions necessary uh, so that as a whole, the organization can function and move forward in an appropriate manner. So you do have the, the latest revision of the CAL is dated in February 23rd. All right, thank you for that clarification. I understand you have concerns about how Fort Calhoun has been implementing the operability process. And this is the process by which the licensee argues that even though it has degraded conditions at the plant or non-conforming conditions when looking at its license, it is nevertheless operable. And you have indicated that there were several inadequate operability determinations that you discovered in this CAL inspection. Could you fill us in on that, like give a couple of examples of the areas in which improper or inadequate operability determinations were found. Do you want to go into details? Okay. Yeah. I got the report here. Ms. Moore, we're we're taking a look at the report. That as as we've discussed, there were a lot of issues here. So, so for just give Greg a second. Why don't I come back to it uh, when I, I have the report here. It's a draft report, and I can give you uh, several of the examples uh, where we found that uh, operability was inappropriate. Okay. Yeah, well, bef before we're done in this section of this, we will address it in a public manner, but just, uh -huh. just give them a okay. check-in to get I it. And we're, we're ready to get your next question. All right, thank you. <laughs> All right, well, I, ha I have just a, a couple of observations regarding the operability process as it relates to Fort Calhoun while you're looking at the details on that. In light of what Inspection Manual Part 9900 provides, it does not appear that Fort Calhoun is even eligible for using the operability argument. This is because it is a facility that's experiencing significant performance problems that have led to issuance of a confirmatory action letter. See page 12. Part 9900. It does not appear that uh, Fort Calhoun at this point, because of its poor performance, is even eligible to use operability determinations. But even if Fort Calhoun is eligible for using the operability argument, the licensee may not use it to delay making modifications needed to bring the plant into conformance. For example, OPPD wants to wait to do all the shoring up of the beams and columns in the containment building that are non-conforming to its license until after restart during the next outage. Inspection Manual Part 9900 provides that repair or replacement activities to resolve the non-conforming conditions should be done at the first available opportunity. The first available opportunity is now, during the current outage. The quickest way to fix these nonconformances is now, while the plant is shut down. There is no reasonable justification for waiting until the next outage. Was that a comment or a question? That was a comment. <laughs> Waiting for the answers to my question, that was a comment. Okay. Uh, just to give you the, the broad perspective on how the NRC treats licensees that are using the degraded non-conformance process. 
With respect to the timeliness of corrective actions, uh, what you read is obviously our guidance, and, and we do uh, ensure that licensees fully understand what the problem is and fully take advantage of the most opportune opportunity to repair or correct those problems. Now, with respect to every problem, they're, they're all looked at differently and individually. Some problems, for whatever reasons, cannot be repaired timely, meaning like the very next day, because you may not have the parts, you may not have the right plant conditions to do it, which is why we have this process in place for them to evaluate that the system structures and components will still perform their function, even though they're not fully meeting all of the standards. So what I will tell you is that the containment internal structure, they may not fix that whole issue before restart if, in fact, down the road, we authorize restart. It all depends on what we do through the inspection activities to understand, did they reasonably take actions to evaluate corrective actions that are needed. Now, we've had some discussions. As a matter of fact, we had a public meeting in December where the licensee was talking about how much effort it takes to redesign containment, how much effort it takes to understand how to implement the mods, uh, because it's not an easy process. And it's not something that we want a licensee to do without taking the time to fully evaluate it so that you don't create more problems than what you've already got. So I'm not going to tell you they have to fix it right now. Uh, I'm not going to tell you that it's acceptable for them to fix it in two years from now. What I will tell you is that we're, gonna, we're going to inspect it, and we're going to ensure that the actions they take are reasonable. And, and if you don't mind, I'll, like for the containment, safety will be ensured. We're going to make sure of that, that the containment and the structure can perform the function from the safety. But to make it even safer, OPPD and Fort Calhoun will finish the rest of the modifications. But the containment will be able to, based on our inspections, our independent evaluation will ensure that it can perform its function from a safety perspective. Um, to address your, your previous question about examples of operability issues that have been identified by the team, uh, a, a brief overview, we found where the pull boxes, the electrical pull boxes, which house the cabling for the raw water pumps, were susceptible to failures of uh, other surrounding equipment that could impact the raw water pumps. And when evaluated by the facility, the evaluation was incorrect. Uh, another example of issues that we identified, uh, we found where some relays failed their seismic qualification testing and the facility incorrectly determined that they were operable but degraded, even though they were not able to perform their seismic function or perform their function under a seismic event. And then another example we found where a air cooler unit for the containment uh, was missing a seismic brace and the facility determined it to be operable without proper justification. So those are the examples of the type of issues that we've identified where operability determinations were incorrect at the station. The, those are a few examples. Uh, each of them have been uh, communicated to the licensee. They're in the corrective action program. The licensee is currently working uh, to address the issue, like Mike said, to make sure they can either uh, fully restore the equipment or perform an evaluation to ensure that the uh, equipment is operable such that it will perform its specified safety function. Uh, these types of things uh, or the specifics of these will be fully documented in our inspection report so i encourage you to to go to our report when it's issued and you can get those details and we'll be working with the licensee to make sure they come to the appropriate resolution as mike indicated we look forward to reading your inspection report in great detail thank you <laughs> Linda Ryan, 11130 Jackson Street, Omaha. I'm a ratepayer, and I would like to discuss operability further. To me, it sounds like it's a huge loophole 
We know that Fort Calhoun was not built to design specifications. The margins of safety are already less than they should be. The plant was clearly not built with a large safety margin. So I want to know from the NRC, what assurance is there that any of the non-conforming features that OPPD argues are nevertheless operable will not fail? What assurance will you give me that they will not fail? Thank you, Ms. Ryan. You know, I, because I share the same feelings that you do, um, you know, I've lived in Omaha twice in, in, in my life. I've got friends here. Uh, and not to mention, nuclear power is our job. Uh, nobody wants an unsafe plant. You know, these, these are a couple of, uh, of a group of 15 who are probably some of the best inspectors uh, that, that, I'm, that, you know, that I've had the privilege of knowing, which is why I put this team together. Uh, we identified, obviously, a lot of issues. But that is because, you know, this is a, this is a team that, that is a very elite team. And, and what, what I can assure you is we will continue to have inspectors here to ensure that the plant is safe to operate. I mean, that's, that's, you know, that's why they're in, cre that's why they're in increased oversight is because they've had problems. And we are here to ensure that when we make the call that the plant is safe to restart, that it will be safe to restart. And that, that's the, that's the insurance that I can give you because I feel the same way that you do on how important that, that, that is. And I can assure you, too, from an agency perspective, you know, here's this folks from the regions, the inspectors, but also at headquarters, our reviewers that are involved with the more technical reviews, like with containment, share that same perspective of, of safety. Your intentions, you're, you're well intended to ensure the safety, but frankly, I still don't get that assurance factor from you. I'm Melissa Kaneski. Um, in response to the Fukushima nuclear disaster, the NRC is requiring nuclear plants in the United States to carry out several important tasks. One of them is conducting a flooding walkdown at each plant related to its flood protection features. It's troubling to learn that for Fort Calhoun's flooding walkdown, a reasonable simulation of the flood protection procedures was not conducted. The flooding walkdown report states that instead, the data from the installation of new flood barriers in March 2011 and the procedures used for installation of these barriers during the flood of 2011 were used to demonstrate that the Fort Calhoun flood protection procedures can be executed as written. The report states that no simulations, drills, or exercises of any kind were included in the walkdown scope. I'm certainly not satisfied with that, and I hope the NRC isn't either. Fort Calhoun has exhibited a lot of problems with unreliable data throughout the plant and numerous deficiencies in its procedures. Moreover, in light of their prolonged pattern of performance deficiencies, Fort Calhoun personnel clearly need simulations, drills, and exercises in all areas of the plant, including in flood protection. The inadvertent puncturing of the water berm around the plant during the 2011 flood is an example of why rigorous training that includes simulations, drills, and exercises is needed at Fort Calhoun. This training, which should be accomplished prior to restart, needs to be realistic and demanding, assuming very challenging scenarios, harsh environments, and foul weather. It should layer several adverse situations, for example, hostile action during a flood and concurrent earthquake. To require anything less is to ignore how critical it is to try to bring Fort Calhoun's performance up to a level that can assure prevention and of meltdown and or release of radioactivity in all circumstances. The flooding walkdown 
report also states that 67 penetrations were not inspected <clears throat> because access was restricted. These inspections were to be completed by March 31st, 2013. I'd like to know whether the NRC has received the supplement to Fort Calhoun's flooding walkdown report that documents the inspection of these 67 penetrations. If the NRC has received this report, I'd like to know when it will be posted in Adams, the NRC's public document database, so that we can all study it. Thank you. John, if you don't mind, I'll have John Kirkland answer that question because he's been primarily involved in the, our inspection of the flood recovery actions. And actually, I can get that, Tony. This is a little bit different than the flood recovery actions, mm -hmm. per se, that I've been looking at. Uh, the report uh, that uh, you're particularly speaking of uh, was a temporary instruction that all licensees were required or that we were required to perform of all licensees, not just Fort Calhoun, but uh, San Onofre where uh, Greg's at and Cooper. And uh, if you read the report, it was partially completed and it wasn't that particular inspection uh, was not completely closed out. It's just I mean, almost eerie that you ask the question now when our inspector who is finishing that uh, particular temporary inspection procedure is due back on site next week, at which point she will verify uh, the inspection of those other 67 penetrations. And then that would be included in the report, uh, the report period that concludes uh, the end of June. So that's when we will see that. Uh, my name is Mike Carberry, and I'm a, a downwinder and a downstreamer from Iowa. Uh, in your summary, in, in the report, you mentioned uh, design basis a few times, and that you were concerned about it. Well, we are too. When Fort Calhoun workers do not understand or use a plant's design basis properly to evaluate problems, it's hard to see how they can devise appropriate corrective actions. More fundamentally, it's hard to see how they can understand the design basis when it appears OPPD has lost configuration control of Fort Calhoun. This is evident from all the missing and outdated design documentation in many instances when the plan wasn't built to design specifications. I'd like to hear from the inspection team more detail about what it observed at Fort Calhoun regarding workers' use of the plant's design basis. I can answer that question for you. Uh, the gaps that we saw were, as you described, instances where uh, personnel were not cognizant or not responsible with a level of knowledge commensurate with the design and licensing basis. And as we have identified those, we continue to work through and we continue to monitor what the plant's doing. Uh, by the identification that we've done here, we're not done with the area. That's why we continue to, we recommend to the, to the panel that the engineering design and configuration control area remain open uh, the station has performed another or is in the process of performing another root cause analysis to further explore the weaknesses that were identified and to come to a more fuller understanding. And we will reassess that area in the next inspection effort that we do. Based on what you've told us today and what NRC inspection reports indicate, Fort Calhoun's failure to get a firm grip on its design basis seems to be a very deep-seated and widespread problem throughout the plant. To assure safety, the NRC needs to require that all the design basis documentation problems plant-wide have been rectified before considering restart. The NRC should also require clear demonstration over a reasonable period, such as six months or to a year, that Fort Calhoun personnel fully understand and use Fort Calhoun's design basis in its design making before allowing restart. Given the size and significance of the problem of this problem at Fort Calhoun, it is not good enough for the NRC to simply be able to see improvement. Instead, we need to see indisputable proof that this problem is absolutely fixed before the restart should be considered. Without this proof, the NRC's assurances of safety are written on the wind. I'm Jane from Blair, Nebraska. 
About a year ago, I spoke at an open meeting regarding trust or lack of trust in OPPD and the nuclear power plant. Trust and safety continues to be a concern for me. It's troubling to me that on many occasions over the last year, OPPD has felt they are ready to restart and have announced restart dates, but then uh, you found that they were not ready to, be to begin their operation. I appreciate the peace of mind that I have had now that you are so involved. And my question is, to what extent will you continue to be involved? Will you be as involved in making sure the plant is safe after the restart as you have been uh, now during this uh, restart time? Uh, the answer is yes. We are going to continue to monitor. There will be increased oversight on Fort Calhoun after the plant. If, if and after, you know, it's not a foregone conclusion. I don't tell you that much. We are doing our job. You know, safety is the number one priority. If we come to that, we, we will continue to have increased oversight so that it's demonstrated performance um, through the time because we, in a normal oversight process, there's performance indicators that have to be uh, built up uh, through time, and, and, th and that takes time of operation. And prior to that, we're going to have to do increased inspections to ensure that uh, Fort Calhoun is operated safely. Thank you. To point out that uh, if, if they are allowed to restart, once they restart, they still stay in manual chapter 0350 oversight for a, 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 not even a set amount of time, a, an amount of time where the, the 0350 panel uh, believes that they have gotten to the point where we can like take off the training wheels so it's not once they're allowed to restart we immediately go back to Jacob and I on the site and and routine inspections it won't be like that Thank you. Um, for this round of q and I'm gonna I'm gonna go one more and I, I don't want anybody to think that we're uh, we're trying to dodge questions, we're not, because we're going to pick back up again after OPPD's uh, presentation where it's kind of more an open forum. And it, it includes questions that you still may have specific to the inspection. But uh, in order to, to get through this so that we can get everybody's questions in, uh, we're going to do one more, turn it over to OPPD, and then go from there. OK? Thank you. I'm Ryan Wells. Was there other information you need from me? No, ma'am. Okay. Um, Fort Calhoun's significant performance deficiencies are very troubling to me. These include, one, failure to provide adequate protection against flooding, two, failure to adequately modify and maintain its electrical buses, three, failure of a reactor protection system contact, and four, several other serious and undisclosed security violations. Even more troubling is hearing today that Fort Calhoun's evaluations of each of these significant performance deficiencies still, even two years later, fail to look thoroughly at the full extent of each of the problems throughout the plant. This leads me to question just how appropriate Fort Calhoun's corrective actions can be when the problems aren't properly evaluated in the first place. I understand from the NRC's presentation today that a competent evaluation needs to identify not only the root cause, but also all the contributing causes. <clears throat> Is it true that it's all the contributing causes taken together and OPPD's failure to identify them that have led to Fort Calhoun's significant decline in performance? I'm not sure I fully understand the question. Um, Causes that have added up to the failure of performance. Well, the contributing of performance. causes are identified through a root cause evaluation for an event. Uh, these events were significant. We agree they were significant. In fact, we process them as significant findings, red, yellow, and white, uh, which by our process, uh, uh, that and other issues has put Fort Calhoun into the situation they are under 0350 oversight. Uh, so our role in coming in is to verify that they did, in fact, 
after those events, properly evaluate them, identify the root and contributing causes. Uh, certainly, as you heard me present, uh, in a couple of those cases, we didn't feel that they appropriately identified the root cause. And because of that, uh, some of the contributing causes were, in fact, uh, uh, at least as, as we measured them against the definitions and their procedures, uh, should have been considered as root causes. Uh, I also indicated that some of the, the contributing causes, if, if corrected, could have prevented some of the problems that happened. So I think that's getting the question you had. Uh, uh, that's why we require them to evaluate extent of condition, ex extent of cause, so that they find all those other problems out there, correct them appropriately, so another significant event like the ones that have happened won't happen again. I will highlight once again that for those specific issues, the direct problem, equipment problems that led to them have been resolved. We're not concerned about that. Uh, we're concerned about the other things out there the contributing causes, the root causes, uh, that they take appropriate actions. We're not satisfied yet. Because of that, you heard me indicate that we will, re we will leave those areas open until we see them get to the point that you're talking about, that they're addressing those root causes, contributing causes appropriately, that we're satisfied the actions will appropriately address them, and that they will be effective over the long term to make sure the plant stays safe and those problems do not recur. Thank you. I would just like to say that significant deficiencies in at least four areas mean that we, the ratepayers of OPPD, have a great deal to be concerned about regarding Fort Calhoun, and I'm really glad that you're going to be ongoing uh, investigating things and being sure that it's on track. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, with that, um, Lou, I'm going to turn it over to you for your presentation, and then as I mentioned, once uh, OPPD is finished, then we'll circle back around uh, for more of an open forum. With that, Lou? All right. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Vagel, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We do appreciate the continued opportunity in these public forums to provide updates, as well as progress we're making at Fort Calhoun Station. Again, I'm Lou Cortaposi. I'm the Site Vice President at Fort Calhoun Station, the Chief Nuclear Officer for OPPD. With me today is Mike Prospero, our Plant Manager, Bruce Rash, our Recovery Manager, and at the end of the table is Kerry Enan, he's our Nuclear Oversight Manager. I'd also like to acknowledge the men and women at Fort Calhoun Station who are safely working at the plant today. Our topics for discussion this afternoon will include insights from the NRC inspections. We've heard the results the preliminary results of the major NRC inspection, and basically what have we learned and what actions have we taken since that March inspection. We will discuss our continued progress towards restart. We'll also status some select technical issues that tie to the inspection results. We're also going to discuss our plan for sustained improvement, both an overview from a pre- and post-restart perspective in three key areas, design and licensing basis, corrective action program, and one of the items that was not discussed today that we do want to discuss is operations procedures. And you'll also hear from our independent assessor and his team's plan for monitor monitoring our progress going forward. Again, from the perspective of what have we learned, and I'm going to take the first two areas for additional focus and continuing improvement together. One, you've heard about the documentation and completeness of the design and licensing basis, and then the subsequent engineering and operations knowledge of such design and licensing basis. Based on the inspection, we do recognize that we needed to dig deeper and go back further in time. We also do recognize the importance of translating that operating, in, excuse me, the design and licensing basis into the operating and engineering training programs as well as we've been challenged by our external oversight to broaden that even further. And I'll give you an example. Anytime a, a maintenance technician is changing a bolt, changing a gasket, they need to understand how that can impact configuration control and how that is tied to the licensing and design basis. And Bruce Rash will get into greater detail of what has been done and additional actions that are in place in this area. A third area of insight, again, with the corrective action program where completeness and timeliness of corrector actions in some cases affected the quality of our products. We'll focus in on cause analysis, extent of condition reviews, and corrective actions, and Mike Prospero will detail actions we're taking to continue improve performance in this area. 
We do recognize that a combination of these issues made it more difficult for the inspection team to see not only the path forward, but the results that we've achieved. Also, in some cases, when the team was here in March, the physical work had not, had not properly, or excuse me, sufficiently progressed to allow for full inspection. And it's primarily in the areas of equipment service life where Mike Prospero will highlight the number of overall of activities that we've completed, uh, as well as system readiness, where we gave an opportunity for the inspection team to look at the scoping and look at the process, but as, it, but as discussed, there was still work to be done on those systems back in the March timeframe. A majority of the work on equipment service life, system readiness, and HELB EEQ are completing this month. <clears throat> as noted so far in the meeting, a number of key cross-cutting concerns have been addressed for restart. Those include safety culture, safety conscious work environment, human performance, organizational effectiveness, programmatically the, the corrective action program, although recognizing that there's much improvement for us to do with implementation, as well as the quality assurance and independent oversight. And we do believe that this rebuilding work in these areas has set the foundation for the people, process, and plan improvements we've made and will continue to make. And they also line up with the NRC reactor oversight process cross-cutting cross -cutting areas. With respects to the significant inspection findings addressed for restart, in particular electrical bus fire, flooding, and reactor protection, we do believe that the technical and physical improvements at the plant have been completed. We do recognize that we owe additional work on extent of condition and going forward corrective actions, and both of those are feeders into our plan for sustained improvement that again we'll discuss in greater detail tonight. So with that, I will turn over to Mike Prospero to give big picture progress on plant restart. Thank you, Lou. I am Mike Prospero, the uh, plant manager at the Fort Calhoun Station. Since June 1st, 2012, we've done significant recovery work has been completed. To date at the station, we have generated nearly 27,000 condition reports, effectively using our corrective action program to document deficiencies for resolution. These reports identified almost 8,000 startup activities. Currently, there are fewer than 2,000 remain to be com completed for restart. A total of 32 root cause analysis have been initiated, and 157 apparent cause analysis have been conducted. Several of these address the 15 fundamental performance deficiencies that we've completed. These analyses identify the actions to drive continued improvement in safety and organizational performance. We see clear results, as I've shared with you in my previous meetings. Our performance in safety and human performance errors has improved dramatically and is now among the best in the industry. Fixing the plant continues as one of our main top priorities. Since November 2012, we have completed approximately 21,000 tasks. This is a significant amount of work improving the safety and the reliability of our plant. We are fixing the plant. Today we have approximately 5,000 work tasks to be completed for startup. These tasks are planned and scheduled. 2,300 of these tasks are post-maintenance tests to confirm proper operation of the systems and equipment prior to restart. Currently, we are completing about 150 tasks each day to improve our plant. We have to complete the high energy line break and electrical equipment qualification modifications. We will complete the necessary maintenance work to resolve our equipment service life issues. This slide lists several of our more significant improvements we have made that enhance the safety and the reliability of our plant. We have the right vision, mission, and values. We have the right prior priorities and we're doing the work in the right way. I'm going to turn the presentation over to Bruce Rash. Thank you, Mike. Before we respond a little bit on the raw water pump. Yeah. Um, you can expand a little bit on the raw water pump uh, motor overhaul, you know, because they are the safety related uh, service water system per se. So just to, to understand a little bit more on that one, I'd appreciate it. Actually, on uh, Sunday, we got the Delta raw water mo uh, motor pump back from the vendor. 
We uh, currently had issued it from the storeroom. We're actually uh, putting the raw water pump in place as we uh, speak, and I believe we'll be starting that, that pump. All the uh, engineering will be done on the end of business today, and uh, we'll be going forward to start that pump up next week. Um, and from there, um, if we identify any issues, obviously we will take care of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, 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 that's an opportunity to, to talk about technical rigor and extended condition. The Delta raw water motor in particular uh, had been in service the longest of any of the four motors over the course of the plant's history. And when we did the inspection on the internals of that motor, a uh, very thorough inspection, had some indications that we fixed, uh, but part of the process of doing extended condition is now we're doing you know, similar, similar looks, especially on the Charlie motor that will go out next uh, for an extended condition inspection. And part of, that, uh, part of that motor rebuild and that motor look also included pump and column uh, pump and column looks. And so if you look at the, the work done across the four raw water pumps, and that's a tough word to say, uh, raw water pumps over the, especially over the last six to nine months, we, you know, we feel from a system readiness standpoint that it puts that system, uh, system health much improved. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Bruce Rash. I'm the senior recovery manager for Fort Calhoun Station. Today I'd like to provide an update on select technical issues. The issues that I'd like to brief you on are additional tornado protection, intake structure flood protection, the containment internal structures, and containment penetrations, electrical penetrations. In the area of additional tornado protection, as Ms. Mr. Warnick briefed, the NRC identified that OPPD incorrectly used a probabilistic method to evaluate some aspects of tornado protection. The evaluations had been done on equipment that had been modified in the late 1980 time frame and was not done in accordance with the correct process in that a license amendment request would normally be associated with those kinds of evaluations. We took that input as well as others as Mr. Josie talked about with the raw water pump cable tornado protection and evaluated the concern in its totality and we do understand the scope of the issue. Tornado protection issues will be addressed prior to plant startup. Next slide. Okay. This slide shows the areas uh, that were identified that has vulnerabilities and what the resolutions are and what milestones they're tied to in the schedule. One particular one that I would like to talk about and have pictures to show you on the next slide is the raw water pump pull boxes. These are boxes that contain the cables for the raw water motors as they come out of the ground from the, the manhole system from the intake structure and enter into the aux building. The two cabinets in the oval, in the picture on the left, in the red oval, contain, one contains the Alpha and Charlie cables, the other contains the Bravo and Delta cables. Other than the boxes themselves, there was no tornado protection provided around those to ensure that they would be protected upon impact if, if anything hit those uh, boxes. The picture on the right shows the very substantial uh, tons and tons of barrier that is in, now in place in front of these and there is a steel structure built around them that you can't see behind these uh, barriers that are in front of those. That's one example where a significant improvement to safety has been made for the Fort Calhoun station and input from not only the NRC inspection but our own engineers work has improved our plant uh, to protect against tornado concerns. Mr. Rash, I have a question on this. Yes, sir. Um, this design that you put in place to provide temporary protection, does this meet your current licensing basis for protection or is it done to some other standard? Right now, we're evaluating the license condition. It does not fully meet the license condition as stated right now. It's non-conforming to that. We have a team of engineers evaluating whether the regulatory guide can be adopted in total under 5059. 
or whether a license amendment is required. It does have a temporary modification and a calculation that shows protection to the current NRC standard review plan standards that exist. But right now, today, it does not meet our licensing basis. We're evaluating whether or not we need to change our licensing basis, or whether it can be done under Part 9900. We have not reached the final conclusion of that work. We expect that in the next two weeks. So your temporary modification does not meet your licensing basis, and you're using another NRC document that's not specific for your plant? I'm not in the mode of applicability of this equipment right now. So prior to changing modes where this equipment is required by tech specs, uh, that issue will be resolved. I appreciate the question. Thank you. And that would be fuel reload for the previous slide? That's yeah, correct. That's correct. <laughs> I would now like to go to slide 11, talk about intake flood protection modification. We have enhanced our method to control raw water pump intake bay level during external flooding conditions. We've modified the design to allow operators a more direct control of intake bay level for both rising and lowering river water level during a flood. The procedures are being updated and operator training is being prepared. This will be completed prior to fuel load. There is a graphical representation uh, that shows where the standpipe is. And if you look at the picture, it's the red pipe uh, that, that shows where the water will be controlled and the valves that are associated with that. The operators have an evaluate, a method of monitoring level and can adjust those valves so they let water in or stop water from coming into the intake bay to control level so that the pumps have sufficient water level to perform their function and we do not flood the intake so that they get flooded and cannot perform their function. So that's a, a greatly enhanced uh, method of control for the intake flooding. Now I'd like to go to slide 13, talk about containment internal and, uh, structures. Uh, the NRC is in the process of inspecting containment internal structure calculations. To date, they've asked 82 questions of, of us. 74 of those have been answered and have been provided back to the NRC. And the team is still working on eight outstanding questions. Structural calculations are being revised to clarify specific technical issues in three areas in the internal structure themselves the reactor cavity and compartments, and the reactor head stand. Those calculations will be completed and given uh, the final version to the NRC for final inspection. The operability evaluations will follow after the calcs are completed, and those will be provided prior to fuel load and restart. And we do have third-party technical reviews in progress by technical experts in the industry. The next area I'd like to talk about is the area of containment electrical penetrations. All 172 spare penetrations have been removed and capped. 274 of the 342 penetrations have been replaced and presently 68 penetrations are in progress. And this work will be completed prior to plant heat up. With that, I'd like to turn it back over to Lou to talk about a uh, post-restart plan for sustained improvement. Thanks, Bruce. As you mentioned, I'll provide the uh, overview details and some details on our post-restart plan for sustained improvement. And Mr. Rash and Mr. Prospero will expand on them. We do recognize that we own this plan and we owe it to the NRC. The plan will be will utilize the Exelon procedure noted there, performance improvement integration ma integrated matrix, and that's key for us because it gets us into a fleet standard proven process for being able to develop, implement, and monitor improvement actions. Big picture will include for going forward actions across the 15 fundamental performance deficiencies, as well as the three key areas of design and licensing basis, including knowledge and control, corrective action program, as I mentioned, operating procedures. 
And, there's a, and, and, a, and a, excuse me, and as additionally, Mr. Ash and Prospero will ex expand on these three areas. I also want to provide a brief update on our integration activities into the Exelon fleet and nuclear management model. And we believe this is key to our sustainability at the station. Our on-site reviews in each of the functional areas are wrapping up over the next couple weeks. And this forms the basis of hundreds of actions to close gaps to the management model. And where appropriate, we have pulled forward actions. And a good example of that is nuclear oversight, where we basically did an accelerated adoption of the management model. We've seen positive results at the site, as well as the positive inspection results that were, uh, that were discussed earlier. So with that, and to get into some greater detail in design and licensing basis, the corrective action program and operating procedures, I'll turn it first back over to uh, Mr. Rash. Bruce. Before we, before we yes. just one quick question. This uh, new integrated performance improvement plan that you're developing, the Revision 5, say, the 15 fundamental performance efficiencies are covered, but there was one that was always kind of on the periphery, and that was training. Yeah. Are you going to include <coughs> training as one of the areas that's going to be tracked in this? Yeah, absolutely. Training in total, but also training. If you look at the PIM or the Performance Improvement Integrated Matrix, it will force us by process to look at what is the correct solution. In many cases, or in some cases in the industry, we, we've used training as a as kind of a catch-all, you know, train everybody. This will this will force us into the analytics to say, is training the right solution, either for an entire population or, or sometimes for a smaller population on the site? So each of the areas will ask that training question, and then standing back to looking at training cross-functionally or kind of the, the mortar between the bricks across a number of our areas, we'll, we'll also look at that. In, in addition to that, you know, part of, the, part of the process that we work through the Institute of Nuclear Power that's, as you guys know, is overseen by the NRC, the accreditation process, uh, of which we're in the, the, the last, uh, I'll say, portion of our, um, of our technical training programs right now. There, there's an extensive amount of work that's going on across all of our training programs to continue to strengthen that tool um, as an important performance improvement tool. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Bruce. And now I'd like to talk about design and licensing basis, root cause. Uh, a design and configuration control was identified as a fu fundamental performance deficiency during the OPPD performance of the 9503 process. A fundamental performance deficiency root cause was completed in October of 2012, and the scope of the review covered 2007 to 2012 and identified causes and actions to improve performance. As has been discussed previously, the focus was primarily on organizational structure, roles and responsibility, and oversight of the engineering department. Next slide. <clears throat> Some additional items have been identified both by the NRC and OPPD since October 2012. Primarily accuracy and completeness of the design and licensing basis that challenges the engineer's ability to perform key station processes efficiently. Without easy retrievability and accuracy and completeness of that data slows the engineers down and requires more people to be involved and more people to check the work to make sure that's done correctly. As a result of the new issues that were identified, a new design and licensing basis root cause was commissioned on March 18th, 2013. The scope of the review covered the period from the construction license in 1968, uh, construction permit to the current day there were thousands of documents that were reviewed by an expert team all the way back to the, the pre-licensing uh, and construction period to root out what the issues were, collect the facts, and identify what the causes and actions need to be going forward. The root cause analysis identified that several activities had been performed in the past on several occasions to enhance the accuracy and completeness of the design and licensing basis documentation. One example was the development of design basis documents or DBDs for sp 
specific topical areas which provide roadmaps to information. The DVDs were not always updated in a timely manner to ensure information was accurate, and there were many missed opportunities to ensure open items were closed correctly. This is one example where past activities to, com to enhance the accuracy and completeness was not taken over the goal line to completion. The actions going forward. Hey, Bruce. With respect to the design basis documents that you just discussed, are there any corrective actions to rectify those situations that you currently have? I, I will be discussing that. Oh, and yes, there are. So key actions going forward uh, are, one, I'll start with, with the bottom bullet to address your question, Jacob, is to re-baseline the design and licensing basis. Uh, so that will address the, which documents are part of the licensing and design basis, the retrievability to fill in the gaps of any missing documents, and uh, a decision will be made whether we'll use the DBDs or some other process. Part of the work in doing the proposal and scoping this work will be to look at industry best practices and to do benchmarking prior to taking that task on. We have uh, retained a consultant to write a proposal for us so that we can bid that out to various companies. Part of that will be to use state-of-the-art activities. Whether the DVDs exist, will exist in today's state or in a different form, uh, considering our future workforce, uh, we don't know yet. They know the younger generation of engineers want it on their desktop, they want it electronically, and it certainly makes business sense to do that. And we know there are some plants in the country that do that, so we will be looking at that and, and balancing that with what we need uh, for our station, but that's one activity we will be doing in the scoping of how we proceed with that project. The other key actions going forward uh, for the root cause are to strengthen the engineering assurance group and oversight of key station products uh, from the line organization and externals, including the corporate Exelon engineering staff when required or third-party reviews of products when required. And also, a very significant action will be to train station personnel primarily uh, engineering and operations on the use of design and licensing basis material in the interim and in the long term. With that, I'd like to turn the presentation over to Mike Prospero. But, but now just go back and, and I think we've discussed this before, I'm sorry, is with these activities going on, and, and, and it's good that these are going to go on, you got these plans. What about when the plant gets ready to restart, that what are you gonna to do to ensure that the systems and components that are important to safety, that that they're shored up, that they can provide, that they can, you can ensure that, that they can perform their function? For the startup plan, uh, the system engineering staff will be bringing in additional uh, expertise to help monitor systems and performance as operations changes plant modes and the equipment uh, gets put into different service conditions. So we have the experience of, of seasoned system engineers to assist our system engineers. That's one activity. And then we'll continue uh, with the system health process closeout for the 27 key systems that we did the deep dives on uh, to make sure those action items are closed, including the uh, extended service uh, equipment service life issues that were talked about previously by Mr. Warnick. Two, two other aspects to that, and, and maybe taking a more holistic approach, that uh, we had a, uh, an external team helping us with, I'll say, all things plant startup readiness. And, um, and Greg, for example, from San Onofre, which is uh, working on coming out of an extended outage, uh, we, we took part of that process, which was more driving what the oversight is for some key milestones uh, during plant startup. And then we've also taken some industry procedures from some other plants that have come out of an extended shutdown 
that just add additional milestones above and beyond mode change. For example, starting up a first reactor coolant pump, drawing condenser vacuum, about what that looks like from an operations, maintenance, engineering oversight uh, as we're making you know changes to the uh, as the plant you know as the plant's coming back to life. And so that's one element of it. And then the other piece, uh, which which uh, Kerry will touch on in a bit, is you know what are we doing from an independent oversight standpoint? Uh, whether it's you know independent monitoring of control room performance or independent monitoring of, of this you know process I'm describing as it kind of stacks up the blocks as the plant you know as the plant comes back together. Thank you. So with respect to the engineering assurance group, as we discussed earlier, our concerns with the effectiveness of that group. Can you discuss in the short term uh, any particulars that you're going to do to strengthen the, that that group? There, there are presently uh, seasoned professionals that are in the EAG group that have operations and engineering background. Uh, we have metrics that those folks produce when they review a product. The feedback is given to the engineers. Uh, there's a weekly oversight of those metrics by the engineering director and his team to make sure that uh, the feedback is being given to the engineers that prepare the products and the reviewers that are in line prior to it going to EAG. And we have corporate Exelon looking at our process. We had two, uh, we had the design, corporate design manager on site uh, last week and an uh, equipment reliability manager look at the process both from a design and an engineering um, the product standpoint. And they gave us feedback we have weekly phone calls with the site with the engineering vice president of Exelon to status him on progress, and we are looking at long ter longer term uh, solution to the staffing in that area to make sure that we retain those people so that we have continuity uh, and sustained performance. We're really talking about a culture change. And so the culture change will take some time. We need to keep the EAG in place until we get the engineering leadership and the, the managers uh, effective in their positions. And at the appropriate time, several years down the road, after we've done enough assessing and we've had Carrie's group assess, we'll evaluate whether we still need that function. But primarily, it's strengthening uh, the function today provide an adequate oversight on a consistent basis and until we determine that the engineering staff is self-sufficient without that barrier in place. And that will also improve as we enhance the design and licensing basis retrievability as we go through that action to, to do the rebaselining of the design and licensing basis. So, so it will be some time before the culture is completely where we need it to be. So with respect to the items you're going to strengthen in that group, uh, is, it, is there a procedure associated with this group that someone could use to audit whether or not the, those actions have been effective, or how is that going to be communicated to that group? Yes, there, are there is a procedure and there are metrics. Thank you. It did just the other piece of that, which, which right for us right now, we think it's important to have that safety net on the back end, but, but in parallel, as we talk about um, the most recent round of 5059 uh, training, which you know, which Greg and the team discussed issues with that product quality, um, you know, being able to neck down, you know, by experience level, you know, by validation, by training and qualifications, we've done that. Neck down the number of people that can perform 5059s, um, recognizing that that could be a you know an, an impediment to production, and we're okay with that right now. Um, and, and so as we're Looking at you know strengthening the safety nets, uh, I want to assure that we're strengthening the quality of product that's going in at the same time. Okay, thank you, Bruce. I will now provide an update on the progress of our corrective action program. In our meetings with our staff and the NRC, we have repeatedly mentioned the importance of the corrective action program, along with our safety culture and organizational effectiveness and ensuring that Fort Calhoun can effectively resolve our issues, close gaps to excellence, and continuously improve our performance. Nearly a year ago, we initiated actions to improve our corrective action performance. 
We developed and implemented new corrective action program procedures and guidance. We trained our staff on our expectations and our procedures. And we added additional staff on the corrective action program, analytical data and quality oversight. We saw improvement in, in the identification of issues and the effectiveness of our review boards. Through our self-assessments, we have identified the need for further improvement in the action item closure and timeliness. NRC inspection findings also reinforce this. We have initiated corrective action excellence plan. Some of the actions include adjusted corrective action response times to drive more timely resolution of issues, more focus on the condition review group and senior leaders on the daily corrective action performance, and additional attention by our department and station corrective action review boards to ensure issues are adequately resolved. We also initiated a new root cause assessment. This assessment team is comprised of two Fort Calhoun personnel and six industry experts who have demonstrated corrective action process improvement and experience. The assessment team developed several preliminary insights. Our procedures are good and we are identifying our, issue, our issues. They also confirmed that improvement is needed in the following areas. The consistency and the quality of our root and apparent cause analysis and the rigor and timeliness of our action closures. We have actions in place enhancing the monitoring of our corrective action program performance at the department level and will continue to improve. I will now transition to a discussion on how we are improving our operation procedures. I've got it. Tony's got a question. You can go first. Your mic is closer. With, with respect to uh, what you identified with the cap, it talks about needing to enhance your, your ability to do root cause assessments. You know, we, we talked on multiple occasions about not having done the adequate extent of condition for, for problems. Did your analysis identify anything in that area? Mike, I, uh, we are still doing the root cause analysis, the new one. Um, that is coming up with the, I uh, sat down with the team. It's supposed to be done June 4th. It's where we are ahead of that schedule, and that is going to be one of the items that's going to come up. Yeah, and I, I was with the team this week also, and, 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 and what we're seeing it, is it's, it's just not consistent across the departments, and that's a leadership component. Um, there is a training component to that also as we, you know, ultimately neck down the number of people that will perform, especially root cause analysis. And, and it's, it's the consistency, obviously, that we're looking to drive. You know, as your team noted, in some cases, you know, very good extent of cause, extent of condition. And there is a difference between the two, right? Um, and then in some cases, not. It's either too broad or, or as you look at the multiple root causes that we've done so far, you know, in some cases pointing to each other and just not having a good line of sight for, uh, for enveloping the issue. Thank you. My question kind of gets to the issue identification is good, but the NRC team identified 11 examples where things were not, you know, put into the corrective act. Can you Absolutely. find something that doesn't make sense? Absolutely, Tony. We got some departments right now that are performing pretty well in the corrective action program. And I will tell you, and uh, we got we got two or three departments right now where we got improvement warranted. Uh, most of the issues I found I, were in one of the departments. I'll call it that we're working to improve. Um, my chemistry RP departments, uh, maintenance departments, work management departments are performing pretty well. I have some other departments I am still working through for improvement. Uh, main one I would tell you is probably engineering right now. Because you know, you know, you talked about all the numbers of issues that are put, you know, into process. And yes, if you just look at the numbers, yeah, you have increased the numbers. But then when you get insights from an NRC team that says, "Hey, you're not there. We identified just in two weeks all these issues." That that is something that that's very very important because all the rest of the stuff, evaluating and follow through means nothing if your things are not getting into the process. The, issues are being identified. So I think that'd be key. And you know, when I see something that says issue identification good, I, and I, I, maybe that's one area that you could never really declare victory in. 
Yeah, and we won't. Okay. We won't never declare victory. Yeah, but we're just still recognizing that you know some of the tools that we use, uh, we look, do look at engagement ratio down at the department level, one, to see that individuals are identifying issues. Uh, we've been doing a lot of work with our security department, which happens to be our largest department on site, and has as much eyes and ears you know, in the plant as, as anybody, uh, and, and getting some good you know, productive uh, corrective actions out of that group. Uh, but as you illustrated and the team illustrated, in, in some cases, um, and even in discussion with individuals where, you know, the, the right answer is, you know what, I need to write a CR. Not sure what the answer is, not sure what the question is. Uh, that culture we reinforce, you know, whether it's a, an all-hands meeting, a department meeting, a station meeting, that, you know, when issues, you know, are on the table and we're having meaningful discussion on whether it's personnel issues or, or plant issues, you know, someone ends that sentence, was it, is it in the corrective action program? And that's the behavior that the team's driving right now and, and, and looking for that, you know, to be embraced. And we see elements of that, uh, but that's what, that's what we're driving. Okay. Thank you. I will now transition to discussion on how we're improving our operations procedures. The Fort Calhoun staff identified opportunities to improve our procedures in the safe operation of our facility through benchmarking activities. The NRC also provided insights on operating procedure quality and several inspections. Our operators use several types of procedures to, to safely accomplish work. Everything from normal operating procedures to those that addressed off normal conditions. 208 of these procedures were pro prioritized for review and any necessary enhancement before restart of the plant. These include emergency operating procedures, abnormal operating procedures, enunciated response procedures, and operating instructions. We've got a dedicated team of operators with shift experience and procedure riders assembled to complete this work. The team has reviewed over half of the procedures and identified the need enhancements in content and usability in approximately half of the procedures they have reviewed. These procedures are being revised and they will be validated. Once finalized, our operators will be trained with the new procedures. The final product will be audited by internal and external industrial experts. A follow-up assessment will be provided to the station's nuclear oversight department. When completed, the operating department will have procedures that satisfy industry standards for excellence. We will continue to improve and we're moving in the right direction with regards to our procedures. I would now like to turn the presentation over to Kerry Enan. I've got a question real quick with respect to the uh procedures of the half of the procedures that you have reviewed can you go into any detail any more detail about any issues you have found yeah, some of them Jacob are uh, for example we just found some on with regard to prepping to test some flow testing with our ECC containment spray and lipstick pumps some of them were just to make sure they were complete for the lineups some of them have been enhancements there's been a wide variety of issues uh, one of the other some of our flood procedures we're taking another look at uh, we're making sure some of the new procedures that coming in, like for example, the for the intake structure modifications, that those will meet our requirements. Have the uh, emergency operating procedures and the abnormal operating procedures, or where are they at with respect to uh, order in which they will be reviewed? They're all gonna, the ones that we picked up are the 208. All those will be done before we do our restart, and which <coughs> our target right now we're on we're about halfway through. It uh, looks like we'll be done either the very end of May or the very beginning of June, so they will all be done before we heat up. So of the 208, those include the emergency and abnormal operating procedures? That's correct. Okay, thank you. So it sounds like a big review, a lot of, lot of issues you're identifying. Yeah. What kind of backlogs are you getting for the revisions to correct the problems or enhance them as identified? Are you able to step through them? Are you prioritizing the procedures for revision? Yeah, we're, we're, our intentions are to have them done before heat up. Okay, right. well, some of them, enunciate a response, emergency oh, procedures may be necessary yeah, now. Yeah, what kind of prioritization uh, are you putting on with the procedures for issues you identify? We prioritize the procedures that we need for startup. None procedures that we may not need down, down the road, we're going to go through them all too. But for now, though, all the, everything needed for startup. Yeah, and part, part, Part of our Saturday outage package, and, and actually gets looked at more frequently than that, and, and part of our department readiness, you know, had not only operations but the other departments look at procedure backlog and, and make that triage between a pre and post restart. 
Uh, and what Mike's talking about here is, is above and beyond that. You know, the work and the feedback we've gotten both, uh, both from the NRC as well as our own internal assessments, you know, looked at the level of detail and operating procedures. And, and as the workforce continues to transition, you know, is it at the right level? And it's everything from, you know, that, that combination of operator knowledge um, in, in conjunction with the procedure that they can routinely and consistently perform as we expect. And so that body of work has expanded to, to include these 208. Um, there's additional work post restart as the combustion engineering owners group has, you know, rebaseline the emergency operating procedures um, at the beginning of this year. Um, and as well as, you know, the work that we do in design and licensing basis, that just forms such an important foundation, um, especially for the EOPs and set points. And so we anticipate some additional work. Uh, and so as much, you know, there's technical issues that we've gone through, but it's as much formatting um, and, and human factors so that the operators can, can perform consistently. And what I like about it, like to this last week, we had a senior reactor operator reviewing them, a reactor operator and an equipment operator. So the people actually using the procedures in the field are the ones doing this. We had basically the whole crew doing it. So with respect to the design, concerns that you've expressed and we've expressed, how are you tackling the issue of ensuring you don't have fatal flaws in your procedures based on uh, either unavailable or inadequate information for your design? And part of that, Jacob, goes right back to where we're, um, um, when we, as the operators go through them, we are training our operators to in the design because the engineering and the operators are. And if there's any questions at all or doubts, we're getting the engineering people involved and we also, some of them are, will have to go through the 50-59 process, potentially, right, for screening. And if I need to, I'll have the AG review whatever needs to be done. Is the process you're using, is it proceduralized? Yes. For what? For what, what? Or re re review and validation or verification and validation of procedures? Right. Different yeah. operators have different levels of experience, understanding, and yeah. training. And I'm, I'm asking if you're giving them a standard to look at so they can each... Uh, in a uh, deliberate manner, evaluate against specific criteria. We got the writer's guide, but uh, I, you know, as far as each equipment operator at the same level, no, I, I, I will tell you that. Yeah, I, I tell you, and this is just anecdotal, but you know, talking with a, a couple of the reactor operators in the control room, that um, you know, uh, I believe the team has been briefed at, you know taking not only the experienced individuals because they have good technical input into it, but balancing that with the newer operators and, and the recognition, you know, with the more experienced operators that this is an important part of the knowledge transfer process. So just kind of standing back and, and talking about why we're doing this and, and why it's important not only for performance now, but for state sustained performance going forward is what we're driving into the operations team. And, and I believe they have embraced that concept. Uh, you, as you know, you know, operating procedures at the station um, has been an issue and an issue identified in the past and that in some cases hasn't been driven to resolution. A good example for our intake structure modification with the uh, eight valve, you know, we put the four valves in, put the actuators up, and we also now we're doing another mod to the second four valves we put in with the T handles to get them above the area. That was part of the walk down process that the operators are doing. So a successful one. Thank you. Kerry? Thank, thank you, Michael. My name is Kerry Enan. I am the Nuclear Oversight Manager at OPPD. As the Nuclear Oversight Manager, I am completely independent of the Nuclear Operations Chain of Command. I've spoken to you at these public meetings about the Strengthened Independent Oversight Program and offered my independent perspectives on Fort Calhoun Station performance. Today, I'm going to talk about the independent oversight activities that are being performed as they relate to the restart efforts at Fort Calhoun. First, I would like to briefly describe my team's return to service plan. My independent team has developed a plan that we are using to assess activities to validate the station's determination that they are ready for restart. The plan contains five elements. First, is a review of, to determine compliance with the procedures and programs that the station is following to prepare for restart. This includes things like challenge boards for major issues and preparations for NRC inspections. Second is the plan for management and human performance improvements. Mike and Lou have talked about these actions and my team will verify that these actions are institutionalized 
and incorporated for the long term. The next element of my team's plan is a review of system health. We will verify the actions taken by the station are acceptable with regard to plant system reviews and department readiness reviews. The oversight plan also includes inspections and assessments of the physical work that's being performed, and we will verify the work is in accordance with the engineering documentation. Lastly, the plan includes a review and verification that the station completes all required elements of the confirmatory action plan, and I will independently determine readiness for, in, for restart. Now I want to describe some changes that have been made to the other element of independent assessment that I've talked about. That was, was called the Safety Audit and Review Committee. Okay. We've incorporated... Just, just, I'm sorry. Just a quick question, just before you go on to the Nuclear Safety Review Board. The Integrated Performance Improvement Plan, are you going to, once it gets, you know, goes through the development process and stuff, and it is very important, what role will you play in that? Th that's the last piece of that element, the fifth element that I talked about in that. Um, I will independently assess readiness for restart. So it's that, uh, it's that last piece, and the IPIP is one of those items we will review, Mr. Bagel. Oh, okay. So it's specifically called out that yes. you will review it. Okay. Yep. Thank you. The Safety Audit and Review Committee, we've now incorporated the Exelon Fleet Process, and that's now referred to as the Nuclear Safety Review Board, which is a term common in the industry. It's a collegial body made up of six independent experts, consisting of a chairman, a vice chairman, and four subcommittee chairs. Each of these individuals has extensive nuclear experience. These outside experts perform similar duties at approximately 50% of the nuclear plants in the United States, and they bring that knowledge to their independent assessment of performance at Fort Calhoun. The four subcommittees function to review station performance at the department level, and each subcommittee is made up of the Fort Calhoun department heads and peers from the Exelon fleet and the corporate offices. This composition enables direct feedback and challenge from the subcommittee chair as well as members from the fleet. They provide the results of their observations directly to the chief nuclear officer, the OPPD chief executive officer, and to the board of directors. They most recently met April 30th and May 1st to review site performance and the status of restart efforts. In closing, these two aspects of independent assessment, my team's plan for restart readiness and the Nuclear Safety Review Board are providing intrusive, independent looks and challenges as the station continues to prepare for restart. I'll now return the presentation back to Lou. All right, thanks, Kerry. Just, just some brief closing remarks. You know, today we do appreciate the opportunity to have update on the insights that we've taken from the NRC inspection, and I use the term what we've learned and actions that we've taken uh, since the team left the site in March. Uh, there is continued progress towards restart, as Mr. Prospero illustrated. And as we talked about the status of some select technical issues, and you can see how that uh, the physical work even in those areas continues to neck down as we approach core reload and ultimately restart. Uh, we did inter introduce in some greater detail the plan for sustained improvement, and specifically those three areas. Again, insights that we gained from the inspections as well as our own looks and the design and licensing basis, the corrective action program, and the operations procedures. And finally, again, like we've done in previous meetings, how we're being independently assessed on our performance, uh, not only by Mr. Enan and his team, uh, but from other individuals outside of Fort Calhoun Station. So again, we thank you for this opportunity. And with that, I'll turn the meeting back over to you, Mr. Vagel. I'd like to thank you for providing the insights and update. And you know, now if you step back a little bit for today's meeting, you know, it's kind of a good news, bad news. I don't know which one went first, per se. But you know, on a good news perspective, you know, you are taking the actions to address the issues from from the learnings. I mean, there's been it was prompt. I mean, Mr. Rash talked about some of the issues that the team had identified in the engineering design issues. You did take prompt actions. Some included extensive reviews, and some included even actual modifications being implemented in the plan. So I want to compliment you on that and that you took the insights from the NRC and applied them and learned from them. That's good. 
But it's a bad news piece of it is they were NRC identified. And that that'd be one of the things that you might be wanting to be looking for is to, to put your, you know, don't rely on the NRC. You ought to be identifying those shortcomings, addressing them, and then we, we would come by to independently evaluate it. And, and on this too is, you know, you've done a lot of efforts clearly, but we will continue to inspect and really be performance based. That's how we're gonna judge, are you ready to, is it gonna be the performance that counts. So with that, uh, really appreciate your, your insights. And what I would like to suggest now that we take about a 10 minute break and then we'll go right into the question and answer session. So that, thank you. Okay, folks, I think we're ready for our uh, second Q&A period. Um, and if there is no objections, I think we'll handle it uh, pretty much like we did the first. Um, if you can give me a little wave or something uh, that you'd like to ask a question and and I can make my way to you. And um, again, if you would, uh, your name, any affiliation uh, that you wish to be associated with. And this time, uh, since it's really more of an open forum, um, if your question is uh, for the NRC or for OPPD, um, I would appreciate that. We've got about an hour, so with the other, with that about an hour and a half. So hopefully we can get through everybody. So. Laura Evans, during the January 8th briefing of NRC commissioners, it was good to hear plant manager Mike Prospero's commitment that OPPD would get all the Fukushima flood issues done before restart. These include the flood hazard reevaluation that assesses cascading failure of the six dams upstream on the Missouri River. While the NRC has set a due date, for this reevaluation in March 2014, I was glad to learn that OPPD does not plan to restart until it completes this important reevaluation. I was less encouraged to hear at the March meeting the bold assertion by OPPD that Fort Calhoun is safe from flooding. Analysis by NRC senior reactor analyst David Loveless in 2011 demonstrates a current high risk hazard from a flood that could overwhelm Fort Calhoun at up to a level 46 feet higher than its current design basis if just one of the six upstream dams breaks. Therefore, it appears that OPPD has had its head in the sand or in the karst regarding the actual flooding risks to the plant. The station's flooding mitigation strategy is based on the 1990s projection by the Corps of Engineers. However, according to the 2011 NRC analysis, Fort Calhoun's flood estimates are based on relatively outdated flood estimation methods and or probable precipitation estimates. OPPD asserted that the flood risk at Fort Calhoun from significant <coughs> precipitation and failure of four upstream dams is four in one million. This risk estimate is obviously <coughs> superseded by Mr. Lovelace's 2011 analysis that concluded if just one dam, Oahe, broke, there is a chance of one in 1,667 of core damage clearly a much higher risk. OPPD does not engender public confidence in its evaluation and problem solving when it fails to incorporate up-to-date flood estimation methods, probable precipitation estimates, and recent NRC analyses regarding the actual flooding risk at Fort Calhoun. I also asked the NRC 0350 panel to not allow public safety to be held hostage to tunnel thinking regarding design basis events versus beyond design basis events. NRC Chairman Allison McFarlane recently noted that what the nuclear industry frequently characterizes as extreme events are in reality normal events. Now that the 2011 flooding at Fort Calhoun and tsunami at Fukushima have happened, science has moved along a bit. 
and now we understand what the suite of possible normal events is. Chairman McFarland stated that, as a result, we need to revisit what the design basis event is and what it includes. In the same vein, NRC Commissioner George Apostolakis noted that while Fukushima was an extreme event in terms of what happened, in terms of probabilities in the nuclear safety arena, it's about one in a thousand, not that rare. Keep in mind that the risk of core damage at Fort Calhoun from rupture of the Oahe Dam is in the same ballpark, according to Mr. Lovelace's analysis. <coughs> Commissioner Apostolakis also noted that most, if not all, design basis events were developed 40 years ago, an era when they didn't pay much attention to human error. Now we know this is a major contributor to risk. He also said the single failure criterion dealt only with hardware single failures. Bottom line, he said the design basis envelope at each plant must be brought up to date. The NRC has a responsibility to assure public safety in light of the risks as we now know them. These risks need to be informed by current data and competent, forward-thinking, comprehensive analyses. OPPD must not be allowed to get by with procedures that are based on outdated data, assumptions and analysis, and or overly narrow problem identification. Thank you. Thank you for that comment. Do you have anything you want to say, Tony? OK. <clears throat> some patience. I don't have a prepared statement. And, and that report earlier is bubbling in my head. So management, management, management. I kept hearing that. Management decisions that weren't correct. And, 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 and I'm just reeling from that. Because before we hired the Exelon boys, we had a plant manager and a vice president of nuclear at our board meetings. Now, I was able to question them directly. And they made statements that there was no water in the buildings during the flood, which you corrected them on and said that there were three. Now, we had two board members also say that there was no water in the buildings. Now, we have a current president of our board who's openly admitted at those board meetings that he knows nothing about how a nuclear power plant runs. Now, since we've hired them, they no longer show up to the board meetings because they do not work for OPPD. They work for Exelon. For me to have access to these two men, I will have to complain to Chicago, their boss. Because I'm not their boss. They, they work for a private company. I own a public utility. So to correct that, our public utility has assigned all of the vice presidents new duties at the Fort Calhoun power plant. Now, these men don't necessarily specifically have nuclear backgrounds. I know they have degrees. But they are currently in charge of distribution and coal generation, and now they're working and having to decipher this nuclear information. And they're the ones that report to the board at these executive meetings. I've been to those executive meetings. And the consensus of the report is that you came, you left, and you had good communication. Nothing specific, nothing technical, nothing really in those reports to the board. Now, at the last NRC meeting, you commented to me in private that when Lee Terry made some miscomments in the press, you actually went out and visited him. So I guess my question is, are you in direct connection, direct contact with the board members who are making the financial decisions to pay for the $144 million that we have to spend on all this kind of thing? I, I'm from an O350 panel perspective, no. So what's interesting about that is since this has happened and since they went into the 0350 committee, we have a new layer of management in between the board and the Fort Calhoun station. And so there's a new layer that's been created. And I think that's part of the disconnect. I think that's why you're having these mistakes. I think that's why they're calling you in to inspect things that aren't ready. 
is because they don't really have full oversight from the board, from me, from the public, because we can't access these two men anymore. And, and I just wanted to say that. It's just my comment. And I, I hope you kind of consider part of the structural differences yeah. there. But thank you for your comments. But, but that's why we have these public meetings <clears throat> to, the, to allow for people to hear what is going on, like the inspection exit. Thank you. Mary Ann Kresman again. I want to affirm that instead of allowing OPPD to lead NRC officials around regarding which issues need, a, need attention, the NRC needs to be and continue to be proactive and aggressive in identifying and investigating problems at Fort Calhoun. Equally important, the NRC needs to validate all of OPPD's inputs and assumptions. In 2002, the NRC's Lessons Learned Task Force issued a report on the NRC's handling of the davis Bessey reactor vessel head damage. The damage involved discovery of a football-sized hole in the reactor vessel head caused primarily by boric acid corrosion. The task force concluded that this dangerous problem was preventable. The report cited many instances where the NRC failed to independently validate key assumptions of the licensee. Among several things the task force recommended, the NRC determine whether additional analysis and testing are needed to reduce the uncertainties in the models used. With respect to Fort Calhoun's containment internal structure problems, OPPD is relying heavily upon several models in its arguments that the plant is operable even though it fails to conform to its license. The NRC needs to rigorously and relentlessly challenge every one of the assumptions and data inputs OPPD is using in its modeling. In fact, the NRC needs to complete independent, rigorous review of every one of the OPPD's data inputs and assumptions regarding all matters plant-wide. The restart checklist basis document says at item 2D that the structural design of the containment internal, internal structures is being reanalyzed by the licensee. The NRC also needs to reanalyze this structural design. History has demonstrated that OPPD analysis is frequently neither reliable nor credible. Furthermore, OPPD has admitted that it's known since the 1990s that calculations were incorrect, incomplete, and or missing, and that as-built drawings do not match the design drawings for these structures. We've seen that OPPD has previously wasted taxpayer ratepayer uh, ratepayer money by denying violations the NRC cites. OPPD is now spending millions of dollars of ratepayer money to come up with convoluted arguments to try to pull one over on the NRC so Fort Calhoun can be restarted. OPPD recently claimed to the NRC that the problems with the loads on beam 22 are now wiped away by new analysis. OPPD claims that by using scenarios where the live load is reduced, beam 22 is able to meet its design function. This argument seems doubtful. Moreover, it doesn't address any of the other 46 beams or the five columns that also fail to conform to Fort Calhoun's licensing basis. Furthermore, it's hard to figure out, <clears throat> it's hard to feature how the live loads for all of these non-conforming beams and columns can be constantly juggled while the plant is running. As former EPA Administrator William Ruckelshaus said, modeling and risk assessment data can be like a captured spy. Torture it long enough and it'll tell you anything. The NRC needs to see through OPPD's tortured modeling. We are holding the NRC accountable for every bit of what it accepts from, o from OPPD. Thank you. If you, have, if you don't mind, I'll just add on that. Is we are doing independent reviews. You know, they've talked about the multiple questions that we've, we've asked, specifically on the containment structures issue, and we are asking questions about the assumptions that have gone into the calculations, and the technical experts are in headquarters, and they've, they've been actively involved in that. So thank you. Uh, 
I would like to uh, add on to the uh, very apt comments of the uh, first speaker in this uh, session concerning the vulnerability of uh, Fort Calhoun Station to uh, flooding by uh, a dam failure upstream in the Missouri River. I'm a meteorologist. Uh, during the uh, flooding, I became aware of how hazardous this entire situation was because we had major damage on two of those upstream dams. And regardless of what the Army Corps of Engineers feels are the probabilities, in fact, what they had to do was uh, repair the concrete spillway on what is basically an earthen dam for two of those dams. I think it's quite appropriate to be looking at that because if they ever get into a situation where they cannot hold back the uh, flow of water from one of those upstream dams and the spillway is insufficient to contain the flow of water, one of those dams will breach. Uh, the meteorological antecedents of such an event are things that we have seen. Uh, the first thing you need is a stuck weather pattern that's stuck on wet. We've seen that in a number of cases, the most obvious being the 1993 flooding. Uh, another very instructive example is the 1935 flooding of the Republican River. In that particular case, there was up to 20 inches of rainfall in northeast Colorado an area that is normally quite dry. However, in that particular case, they got stuck on wet enough to receive their entire annual rainfall in a relatively short period of time. And there was an uncontrolled and large release of water down the Republican River uh, that included large amounts of rafted debris and substantial damage. Uh, the same thing could easily occur upstream on the Missouri. You had a, a rainfall event of approximately eight inches uh, in the uh, upstream areas uh, from, to cause the 2011 flood over in Montana. However, we have seen larger events than that further downstream, and we are easily within the vulnerability of having such an event farther upstream. It's a matter of luck so far, and once you have the bad luck, then you have no idea whether you can control that water as it comes downstream. If you can't control it, you're going to be having not just water, you're going to be having houses, big logs, all kinds of things coming down at a very high rate of speed. The NRC really needs to uh, be on top of that possibility because otherwise uh, I'm afraid that what you'll end up is a situation where you're trying to pick up fuel rods off the, uh, the flood plain uh, once the uh, containment structure for the, uh, uh, for the fuel rods that are spent has been smashed. And I'm very glad that you're looking into it. I encourage you to continue to do it because I really think that that situation needs to be addressed. As I said, it was not imaginable to me before the 2011 flood that we would be in that kind of danger. But after realizing the vulnerability of the upstream dams, including the Oahe Dam, and also seeing the meteorological situation that caused the flooding, which was not that extreme. Uh, all it was was a stuck pattern with a lot of moisture in it. It could have easily stuck for a longer period of time over the area that it was. Uh, it could have had more moisture in it like the 1993 event had. And in the uh, background of continued climate change where we're seeing increasing amounts of precipitable water, the meteorologists call it, the total amount of moisture in the atmosphere uh, getting transported further and further north and west. On occasion, 
uh, this definitely needs to be part of your evaluation of the safety of this and the other plants that are uh, located in the Missouri River Valley. Thank you. Now, thank you for your comments and your insights. And, and we do take that very seriously, the impact of river flooding and the impact on you know, all the rivers. And there is a lot of activity within the Nuclear Regulatory Commission working with other agencies as well that that area or that flooding is better understood and evaluated. But thank you very much for your insights. I appreciate thank you. Linda Ryan, I'm an Omaha ratepayer. OPPD may have completed thousands of an individual tasks at Fort Calhoun, but it's clear from the NRC's findings that those tasks are not necessarily appropriate, nor do they reliably, re reliably yield a quality product. It's also clear that Fort Calhoun continues to fail at the equally important task of competently and thoroughly evaluating the fundamental problems known to exist at Fort Calhoun and accurately assessing the overall situation. One of these fundamental problems is the obvious dearth of personnel, including senior managers, who display the requisite good judgment. Unfortunately, it has become quite obvious that when it comes to evaluating problems at Fort Calhoun, OPPD and its very expensive Exelon managers do not have the right stuff. They are like the vision-impaired cartoon character Mr. Magoo, alone in the co cockpit of a broken-down F-16 fighter jet. He fiddles with all the cockpit switches and the engine suddenly fires up. He repeats to himself several times, I believe in safety, I'm striving for excellence. Then he boasts, I'm ready to fly this jet. The situation at Fort Calhoun Station is equally deplorable and equally dangerous. Signs of improvement in safety culture do not add up to possessing and consistently exercising good judgment. Feeling free to speak up about concerns is not equivalent to conducting high quality analyses and evaluations necessary to protect public safety or properly identifying how widely a problem exists in the plant. Lack of good judgment is a fundamental deficiency that is not easily fixed. Several clear signs of poor judgment at Fort Calhoun are the numerous predictions of heat up or restart dates publicly announced by top managers that have come and gone. Fort Calhoun personnel do not display enough good judgment to accurately tell when they are ready for NRC inspections, much less determine when they are ready for restart. The NRC bears some responsibility for allowing Fort Calhoun to operate so poorly for so long. Now the NRC should make up for it by requiring demonstrated competence at Fort Calhoun, that is, consistent absence of performance deficiencies in all areas throughout the plant. Since the 0350 panel can tailor its oversight activities to the needs of the situation, as former panel Vice Chair John Lubinsky told us last summer, uh, the panel has authority to require absence of performance deficiencies for an extended period before considering restart. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. No, appreciate your, your insights, and we're also, but you know, I guess there's several comments I got on that. Is yes, we are monitoring the the performance at Fort Calhoun very closely, as as you heard today, and we are going to continue to to do that as well, and then we'll, we ensure if it gets to the, you know, that, that performance will continue to, that they have mechanisms in place that to ensure that the performance is sustained and continues to improve. Eileen Wells again. Um, I live in North Omaha, just south of Fort Calhoun, and so I'm very concerned about the inadequate flood protection at Fort Calhoun Station. The flooding walkdown report completed last November that identified degraded, non-conforming, or unanalyzed conditions at Fort Calhoun's flood protection features certainly does not alleviate my concerns. <clears throat> Quite a number of leakages, cracks, and gaps were identified. 
<clears throat> and several cracks were found on the south and west walls of the auxiliary building and on the west wall of the intake structure gaps between the floor slab and the bottom of the wall exist around the east, south, and west sides, apparently in the containment building. These are just a few of the examples of potential penetrations in Fort Calhoun's flood protection that require additional evaluation. Unfortunately, Fort Calhoun Station is not good at conducting evaluations. <clears throat> the record contains numerous instances of failures to conduct adequate or competent evaluation and analyses of the problems identified, a very fundamental performance deficiency that appears again and again. Plant personnel also have a lot of trouble thinking through the problems properly so as to determine accurately the extent of the condition at the plant and then determining appropriate corrective actions. Worse, Fort Calhoun and, I'm sorry, Fort Calhoun workers and managers lack discernment on even more basic issues. In November, the NRC cited a violation for Fort Calhoun's failure to properly identify all the pertinent external flood protection features to be included in the flooding walkdown list. Fort Calhoun failed to include the six circulating water river sluice gates, an essential part of its uh, design basis flood mitigation strategy, as well as 14 additional active components. According to the NRC, OPPD acknowledged that it would not have identified the omitted critical active components that serve as flood barriers during the subsequent reviews if the inspector did not identify it to them. The inspection report concluded that the failure to scope these components would have prevented OPPD from identifying that preventive maintenance tasks needed to be created and some active components that are an essential part of the flood mitigation strategy flood mitigation strategy would not have been inspected and tested. And I want to thank you, Tony, for reminding that OPPD that it is responsible to f discover these things before you bring it to their attention. <clears throat> in light of the pervasive and longstanding performance deficits at uh, Fort Calhoun regarding program identification, analysis, evaluation, and resolution, the NRC needs to require prolonged deficiency-free competence to be demonstrated by Fort Calhoun before considering restart. I think you've already said that you're going to do that, but I really appreciate that. Safety culture assessments touch on only a small sliver of the problem with Fort Calhoun's performance deficiencies. Even when employees feel free to speak out about problems at the plant, Fort Calhoun frequently does not alleviate or fix the problems properly. That's why it's incumbent on NRC to require demonstration of a deficiency free competence to ensure that the people and processes at Fort Calhoun actually do achieve complete safety. Lynn Moore. As more and more information is revealed, it is clear that OPPD is not carrying out its responsibility to keep Fort Calhoun Station adequately protected from flooding or the public safe from the result. We know from two different NRC analyses in 2011 that Fort Calhoun is not capable of complying with its flooding licensing basis because of the current high risk from rupture of the Oahe Dam. From the flooding walkdown report, we know that the plant has numerous gaps, cracks, and leakages. We also know from that report that Fort Calhoun's licensing basis does not discuss flood duration or weather conditions that could come with flooding. It only considers maximum rainfall instead of being analyzed for probable maximum precipitation as current industry standards require. The contractor hired by OPPD to conduct the flooding walkdown assessment took pains to emphasize that Fort Calhoun was licensed in accord with 1967 criteria and that Fort Calhoun is not committed to later codes and standards related to flooding. For this reason, the flooding walkdown assessment did not analyze the plant for certain conditions required by later codes and standards. The contractor's report says, in essence, that Fort Calhoun doesn't have to comply with the more protective, stricter flooding standards. This is troubling. It was even more troubling to hear the comments of Susan Landall, one of the Exelon managers representing OPPD, during the January 8th briefing for the Nuclear Regulatory Commissioners. 
She indicated that they are on top of the current improved industry standards and they were not making excuses for or rationalizing previous lower standards at Fort Calhoun. However, at no time during this briefing did she or any other OPPD representative make clear to the commissioners that OPPD thinks the current industry standards for flooding protection do not apply to Fort Calhoun. You can't have it both ways. Current industry standards are not, in fact, being implemented at Fort Calhoun, as Ms. Landall claimed, if OPPD is asserting that Fort Calhoun is exempt from current industry standards. OPPD President Gary Gates recently told the OPPD board that the utility has a lot of time to make any corrections to Fort Calhoun flooding protection. This statement is unacceptable. Fort Calhoun hasn't complied with its flooding licensing basis since at least 2003. NRC analysis shows high risk danger from upstream dam rupture exists right now. Even if Fort Calhoun remains permanently shut down, the fuel rods will still need to be cooled for many, many years. As happened at Fukushima, flooding can cut off power supplies and lead to meltdown. We expect OPPD to move swiftly to comply fully with all current industry standards for flood protection at Fort Calhoun. And since the current licensing basis is obviously not adequate to protect Fort Calhoun, we also expect the NRC to exert aggressive oversight and require Fort Calhoun to upgrade its licensing basis and put all protective measures in place prior to restart. Thank you. Uh, we are working on looking at the design basis flood level to ensure that it's adequate and uh, I guess that's all I got to say we we agree with you yeah mr. hey I, I, I would add as we've worked with the NRC on beyond design basis flood mitigation you know we are committed right now to improve that strategy that procedure the equipments being procured the operators are actually in this cycle of their requalification training getting the strategy briefing uh, and that will be followed on by additional training and those pieces will be in place before we start up the plant and that is above and beyond anything that's required by us right now as we're in this intermediate period between what the current licensing basis is and what we believe it is um, and until we complete uh, our continued Fukushima actions and, and that's an action that, that we've taken uh, to go strengthen that strategy both from a procedure standpoint from an equipment standpoint and I, and I think it's important to recognize that all the plants in the country are, are doing this. They're all looking at what happened over in Japan and whether or not there are things that they can do today based on current analysis that are prudent. Uh, and, and the NRC is looking at whether or not new requirements need to be made uh, to deal with new information. I just want to affirm that we consider it extremely important that the full analysis on whatever is currently needed for, to protect uh, Fort Calhoun from upstream dam rupture, all that analysis needs to be completed and all then uh, resulting protective actions that need to be put in place as a result need to occur prior to restart, not just a lot of training but the actual protections need to be in place so that it's a fully protected design. And I think it's going to be extremely difficult given the massive amount of water that Mr. Lovelace's analysis predicts can come if Oahe ruptures. That's up to 1,060 feet. That is much, much higher than uh, either uh, OPPD's current licensing design basis of 1,014 or what it claims is is beyond design basis protection. The 1,060 just wipes all of that out. So that's, that's what needs hap to happen prior to restart. Thank you. Mike Carberry. Um, we talk about design basis documents again. I might, might as well change my initials to DBD. It was troubling to learn about OPPD's violation for failure to, failure to maintain and update design bases documents as required at Fort Calhoun 
documents which the NRC said says provide an integral function. OPPD representatives have recently sought to downplay the importance of this performance deficiency by saying that work on design basis documents never ends. However, the NRC inspection report that cited this very significant violation does not seem to agree that Fort Calhoun is toiling continu continuously away on its design basis documents. It, said, it says instead, quote, because Fort Calhoun Station continues to not maintain and update design basis documents, this performance deficiency is in indicative of current plant performance, unquote. Nor is this an isolated problem. The NRC quoted, noted, quote, Fort Calhoun Station has a documented history of not ensuring all applicable regulatory requirements and the design basis are used in the production of quality documents, unquote. This is a very serious failure. A highly experienced nuclear engineer commented that Fort Calhoun's failure to maintain design basis documentation calls into question all of the evaluations, repairs, and upgrades recently completed and currently underway at the plant. Indeed, the NRC noted recently that Fort Calhoun, quote, is currently trying to evaluate, repair, maintain, or modify systems, structures, components, or procedures with the processes that require accurate design information and historical perspective that was intended to be contained or referenced in the design basis documents, unquote. However, the barrier of reliable design and licensing, licensing basis documents at Fort Calhoun is failed. This suggests that all of the plant's calculations and design configuration and documentation should be reevaluated. The restart checklist and basis documents need to be revives, revised to include this important verification by the NRC. NRC inspections also recently expressed concerns about the effectiveness of Fort Calhoun's plant review committee. This committee plays a key role in engineering design and configuration control at the plant by reviewing design change requests. The report says that the inspectors questioned how the committee could be effective without a working level, uh, level knowledge of the fundamental program pro problematic issues that exist at the plant under its current purview and, and the causes. OPPD, OPPD admitted last December during the, the, during the meeting regarding containment in, internal structures that it knew that in the 1990s about missing calculations but decided not to reconstitute them. OPPD also admitted that as-built drawings for the containment internal structures do not match design drawings, drawings which the NRC approved as the foundation for Fort Calhoun's license. Yet OPPD submitted a sworn statement in 1997 assuring the NRC that the physical configuration and performance of Fort Calhoun Station systems, structures, and the components are consistent with its design bases. As the site vice president who signed the sworn statement in 1997, why didn't you come clean and tell the NRC then about the missing calculations, Mr. Gates, and the, and the parts of the plant that were not actually built according to the design drawings? I think for, was that a question? I mean, <clears throat> I'm not sure what the question was. Well, it was to Mr. Gates who signed that documentation in well, 1997 yeah. that said that it, it was consistent with the design basis yeah. when it wasn't. Yeah. What I'd like to do is let's keep this meeting on Fort Calhoun performance. It's, this meeting is not about persons and, and things. You know, some of it is just opinions or, or some of this is also folks just reading back the inspection reports that we had written. But I would appreciate if we could just get – if there's questions – Regarding poor Calpum home performance and our oversight, uh, I'd appreciate if you could focus on that. You know, and I can speak a little bit to uh, your concern. We, I think everybody at both these tables shares your passion. The words you read were my words. I wrote that violation on the design basis documents. It's an integral piece of information that the station's currently dealing with today. The uh, concern with design and licensing basis information touches. Uh, quite a number of aspects that are currently on the restart checklist and defined in the, uh, the, the design basis um, uh, document that, that's 
that describes the checklist. So from that perspective, as you probably heard earlier, Greg uh, talk about the area of engineering design and configuration control is in fact on the restart checklist and it is something that we are not recommending for closure for those very reasons that you're talking about. Laura Evans, the public learned during the April 22nd meeting between the OPPD and NRC that there are modifications in five areas of Fort Calhoun Station that OPPD is in the midst of making or has made. We also learned that OPPD made all of these modifications without first obtaining NRC approval through license amendments. In each case, OPPD handled the process inappropriately. Of equal concern is the revelation that OPPD wants to restart without first receiving each of the needed license amendments. OPPD wants to argue that in each of these five areas, the system structure or component is operable even though it fails to conform to its license. I don't think this argument has merit given that Fort Calhoun is experiencing significant performance problems that, is, that have led to an issuance of a confirmatory action letter, thus making the plan ineligible to use an operability determination as the basis of operation. Moreover, from a safety perspective, the NRC should thoroughly review any license amendment request and then, after the proper public process, issue any meritorious license amendments before considering whether Fort Calhoun should be restarted. Otherwise, how can the public be assured that the modifications Fort Calhoun wants to make are actually appropriate? OPVD has demonstrated poor judgment over many years regarding safety at Fort Calhoun. In fact, just a year ago, OPPD acknowledged that its organizational values regarding problem identification and resolution preclude a self-improving culture and learning environment at Fort Calhoun. What a self-indictment. While new, very, very expensive management has been trying to pull Fort Calhoun out of a very deep cavern of poor, poor performance, it's unrealistic to expect that Fort Calhoun has improved enough to be relied upon at this point to make these important judgments about plant modifications without close NRC review. It is crucial OPPD first get approval through the license amendment process. The details we've heard today from the Cal inspection team make clear that OPPD's long period of poor performance at Fort Calhoun has not yet come to an end. The corrective action program still has a long ways to go before it can be regarded as fully satisfactory. Fort Calhoun personnel still are not properly identifying the root cause and all contributory causes for each problem, much less fully developing appropriate corrective actions to deal with all the causes nor has Fort Calhoun done proper extent of condition reviews as needed. The gamble is still much too risky to allow Fort Calhoun to make any modifications to the plant, then restart without obtaining all license amendments first. This holds true for the very significant containment internal structure nonconformances at the plant, which seem likely to need license amendments as well. We members of the public need the NRC to take important measures to assure public safety by requiring issuance of license amendments rather than reliance on operability determinations before considering restart. Thank you for your comments and we do take the review of license amendments very seriously with the safety being the highest priority. Anybody else? We have about five or ten minutes. Great. 
Okay, again, I would like to thank everybody for their time here this afternoon. I know that the uh, uh, oversight of Fort Calhoun is uh, important to all of us. Um, I'd like to again stress the feedback forms. Um, things I know we did a little bit different this time uh, in the uh, content. Um, that was by design, but uh, the venue, uh, the Q&A session with moving around rather than um, gathering in one place. Again, uh, positive and negative feedback. Uh, we take it all very seriously. Um, and we will have another meeting in Omaha in... Tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Looking forward, I think that we would expect to probably have another public meeting probably in a, in a month or two here in Omaha as well. But there could also be some other public meetings that we would have possibly even in headquarters where the technical experts are on if any other uh, specific issues come up with, like for example, on a containment structures or, or some new issue that comes down the road. Because we do want to continue to be open and uh, transparent in, a, in our O350 activities. And I want to personally uh, thank everybody for coming and have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.